Uh, good morning. My name is Alan Weil. I'm editor in chief of Health Affairs. I'm really thrilled today to uh, be the host of the of the event uh, associated with the release of the February issue of the journal Health Affairs, and it's devoted to diffusion of innovation. I always say a few words at the outset of events like these just to set the stage. This is a topic near and dear to my heart, and it was a uh, challenging issue to put together, but I, which makes me feel even more proud about how it turned out, and I just want to spend a moment on that uh, theme. Um, everyone loves innovation. We're all for it. I've yet to find someone who's against it. Um, <laughs> Diffusion of innovation, however, is the difference between a good idea and a good idea maybe taking root in one place and a good idea actually having a broader impact. And most people who say they're in favor of innovation are in favor of it because they think good things will happen because of it. And if we do not uh, diffuse what we learn and if we don't uh, ref fail to diffuse what we learn doesn't work, then all of the hype and energy about innovation is for naught. And so we were really happy because I would say pretty much every issue of health affairs has at least a few articles about innovations to pull together a theme on, the, on diffusion of innovation. And uh, if you're here, hopefully you know a little something about the topic and uh, you know that diffusion is hard and it's slower than we want it to be, and it's less orderly than we want it to be, and the effects, even if positive in the first instance, are not always replicated when we diffuse. Um, but we also know that there are a lot more resources put into innovation than into diffusion of innovation because the activities that are necessary to diffuse are uh, frankly not as uh, sexy. They're not as exciting to funders, to uh, organizations, to governments. We also know a lot about the role of culture in diffusion, not just uh, adoption of maybe a new technology, like when a new phone comes out and we all want to run down and buy it, but if you're talking about organizational change, which is what most of the innovations people are looking at now in the delivery system, organizational change has a whole cultural element that's quite uh, different and more complex than adoption of a, of a technology. In Washington, I would say that a, the key lever that is used for innovation is the key lever used for most things in Washington, which is money. And the notion is if you uh, either uh, create resources for, in for innovation um, or uh, you create um, incentives, of course, for things to happen, then people will innovate in response to those incentives. And, and I think there's no doubt that that is true. Uh, what it leaves behind, though, is all of the actual one-by-one one changes that have to happen for that to occur. And sometimes market forces and organizational cultures will embrace that, and sometimes they will not. And so we also have a whole host of intermediary organizations that have realized that they have a place in this, uh, and that's to take good ideas and try to help bring them to scale. So um, it's, it's complicated, but it's really important, and I, that's why I'm so happy that we have the issue this month, because if we continue to publish about individual innovations every month, as we will do, but we fail to embrace and understand the complexity of diffusion, <laughs> we will have suboptimal outcomes and the investments we make in innovation will not pay off. So as we pulled together the issue, um, the, the general uh, contents are uh, the same structure we're using this morning and that's why I wanted to give you a sense of what's in the journal uh, issue as well as what we're talking about today. So there's a lot of uh, sort of how does it happen? A little bit more theoretical. Um, there is a whole theory, of course, around the diffusion of innovation, and its application to the healthcare space is, uh, is complicated, and so we need to understand the theory behind it. Um, our second panel will look at models of diffusion. Um, we particularly have uh, specific endeavors uh, funded in, these, in this case uh, by federal agencies to take particular approaches 
to scaling and spreading new ideas. And it's important, given the investment made in those, for us to understand the implications of those. Uh, we have a number of what I'll loosely call case studies. In the journal, only one of them is what you would literally call, from an academic perspective, a case study, but stories of innovation, uh, which, again, we need to read and understand because you get tremendous insights about what it takes, and you get tremendous insights about what people try and feel don't work uh, from, learn from looking at those lessons. We have a number of papers then on, that actually analyze specific innovations and their diffusion and look at how they affect uh, patients, uh, providers, and the health system. So uh, this issue, uh, which as I say, I think it touches on a really central topic for healthcare, spans all the way from theory through models, through practice, through impact. And uh, I'm really proud that we have such a great uh, constellation of papers. And so each of them individually can teach you lessons, but if you're really trying to understand how it happens, what it takes to happen, um, the, the collection of papers does that. So forgive my slightly longer than usual introduction, but this is a, such an important topic uh, for healthcare right now. I wanted to give you a little bit more of context than uh, we often do. So as we go into um, our presentations today, um, there we go. Uh, we do have at the front of the issue a data graphic that pulls together uh, a collection of the papers um, that, and some of the highlights graphically from them. I'd encourage you to look at that as well. Uh, as we kick off, I want to acknowledge the support of the Peterson Center on Healthcare, uh, the Blue Shield of California Foundation, the Leona and Harry Helmsley Charitable Trust, and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality uh, for the support that it takes to put together an issue like this and an event like this. And so let's move uh, to our first panel, which looks at how diffusion happens. We'll be hearing from Jim Deering, professor and chair of the Department of Communications at Michigan State University. Uh, studied and worked under Everett uh, Rogers, uh, well known for his uh, seminal work on the diffusion of innovation, and he's extended it in some very interesting ways that you will hear about today. Um, Andrew Ballas, a professor in the College of Allied Health Sciences at Augusta University, um, where he recently was the dean. Among his other, uh, uh, other entries on his bio, I noticed he was the wild distinguished professor of health policy at the University of Missouri. That's a chair I endowed myself, I'm sure you know. Um, <clears throat> And uh, David Doerr, Professor and Vice Chair of Medical Informatics and Professor of General Internal Medicine and Geriatrics at Oregon Health Sciences University, uh, where I was born. So anyway, enough about me. Let's turn it over uh, to the panel, and I'll give it first uh, to Jim. Thank you, Alan. A pleasure to be here with you today. Thanks also to the staff at Health Affairs for putting together this special issue. It's been about a year long journey. I think a very good one and an honor to be uh, presenting here with both Andrew and David. What have we collectively learned about the diffusion of innovations? One of the key lessons, in my opinion, of this strong collection of empirical articles in the February issue of Health Affairs is the importance of partnerships. And the, in particular, the importance of partnering with intermediary organizations to extend the reach that innovations can achieve, to increase the rate of adoption by individuals or organizations, be they counties, cities, health departments, healthcare systems, and especially to lend credibility to the innovations themselves through association with those intermediary organizations or partnering organizations. Partnering helps to boost innovations up diffusion curves. I think this is very well established by this current issue of health affairs. You can see it clearly in the work of Arlene Bierman and colleagues in their focus on learning collaboratives as a type of intermediary organization. You can see it with Rocco Perla's work with government and CMS playing much the same role. 
with Sarah Ono and looking at extension, uh, both uh, cooperative extension and then healthcare extension as a type of intermediary organization, again, to broaden the reach, to increase the rate, and to associate high credibility intermediaries with particular innovations. We've learned in the study of diffusion that uh, innovations, when you chart them, either by percentage or number, as this diagram suggests, over time, in a cumulative fashion, those innovations uh, exhibit very often a non-linear trajectory, that is a curvilinear S-shaped curve, typical of many diffusion studies. I'll talk more about that in a moment. We also know that uh, innovations decelerate over time. They're displaced, displaced by newer innovations. Not necessarily better, but certainly newer. We also know that innovations, when they're diffusing or not, they exist in a competitive environment, as this diagram also suggests. That is, while most studies focus on one particular innovation and chart its spread, usually that's not the perspective of the potential and actual adopters. They have choices in what to adopt. So it's a competitive marketplace for innovation adoption. Lastly, most innovations don't diffuse. Diffusion is the rare situation. Usually what we see is failure to diffuse of innovations. And that is not always due, as you know, to the quality or effectiveness of the innovations in question. Um, we've learned that there are particular attributes about innovations themselves that can sometimes explain a lot of the variance in why people do what they do and how we respond to innovations. In particular, cost is a key predictor, as is the effectiveness, perceived effectiveness, of the outcomes of using an intervention, as is complexity or simplicity, how easy an innovation is to understand, number one, and number two, how easy it is to implement and use on a regular basis. Cost, effectiveness, and simplicity, along with a fourth attribute or characteristic of compatibility are consistently found to explain considerable variance in adoption decisions. We've also learned that the extent to which you can see the results of an innovation that we call observability and the extent to which you have to commit staff or resources to using an innovation and implementing it, what we call trialability, those can be, under certain circumstances, very important pros and cons also explaining diffusion. We've also learned that social influence matters greatly. Uh, that is, especially for what we call consequential innovations, those that a potential adopter is, is convinced is going to affect how they work or how they live or be very important for their organization or their political jurisdiction. People don't typically make such a weighty decision only based on the perceived attributes of an innovation themselves. They look to others. They look to others as keys, as a heuristic for a basis of what to do themselves. In fact, most of the time, for most innovations, we are looking to other people first rather than making careful, rational, so-called rational cost-benefit analyses. Uh, lastly, a few principles about diffusion. Contextual conditions, political conditions, uh, real-world events can greatly affect receptivity to innovations, thus, it uh, behooves innovation proponents to um, carefully consider the introduction and framing of innovations. That is, waiting can be an excellent strategy if one wants to spread an innovation. Secondly, evidence of effectiveness can be less important to diffusion than cost, complexity, and compatibility. This is a rather consistent finding. We see plenty of ineffective innovations that have spread, just like we see plenty of very good innovations that go nowhere. Third, innovations perceived to be consequential can take years to diffuse because of careful, measured pros and cons, more or less rational, uh, assessments by influential members of adopting communities. That is, opinion leaders or influential members of a particular type, let's say YMCA directors, let's say city public health officials, 
If they're considered to be influential by their peers, those influential individuals tend to carefully assess pros and cons, whereas most of us, most of the time, do not. Once informal opinion leaders adopt, diffusion can be difficult to stop. Getting over that initial hump is key. Fifth, policy diffusion is, as Alan suggested, very uh, aided by resource allocations, and in particular with policy diffusion studies, we find that uh, many innovations start locally, go national, and then spread back down to state level or county level or sometimes city level for implementation. Sixth, state adoption of innovations is often the, re the result of bursts of federal attention, perhaps no surprise, but also state-to-state -state proximity. States adopt sometimes based on what neighboring states do. We also find that homophila states, states that are similar to each other in the US, and political jurisdictions like counties adopt when similar counties also adopt. Seventh, social disparities do result from the diffusion of innovations. Uh, we know this well, and it's a basis for then, of course, targeting to disadvantaged populations with evidence-based innovations. Eighth, knowledge about diffusion processes can be used to affect the rate at which an innovation spreads and which segments benefit first from innovations, whereas otherwise they would not. Ninth, reinvention is becoming a very hot topic. There is strong evidence increasingly that you can do a lot to take the externally valid innovation and tweak it, change it, reframe it to encourage broader adoption among a wide set of potential adopters. And then lastly, easily adaptable or customizable innovations are more likely to spread than those that are not. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I'm Andrew Ballas from Augusta University. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming, and uh, thank you, Health Affairs, for creating this opportunity, this wonderful opportunity, uh, to talk about the dissemination of uh, innovation. And thank you for your leadership, Alan. I really appreciate that, and we all benefit uh, from that. I know that we just have a few minutes for this uh, for these introductions. So, in the interest of time, I would like to start in the uh, 19th century, uh, when. <laughs> There was an interesting encounter at uh, the Chicago uh, uh, conference uh, where Robert Wood Johnson, the first uh, went, uh, he was an exhibitor there, and he uh, went to a presentation by Lister about uh, surgical asepsis. And that was the time when he kind of got the idea and uh, started uh, developing all the supplies that are so much essential uh, to achieve uh, appropriate uh, implementation of those wonderful scientific uh, uh, discoveries uh, that uh, surgical asepsis actually uh, brings uh, to all of us, to all our patients. Unfortunately, this uh, lesson, uh, by, uh, obviously the company became extremely successful and uh, did a lot of uh, good things, a lot more good things uh, for healthcare, uh, but we still, uh, did not learn as a society how much implementation is important and how new ways uh, need to be explored uh, uh, continuously. And there are two kinds of problems as uh, we look at the history of uh, dissemination efforts. Uh, one is certainly when there is a delay and uh, we talk uh, so much about that, uh, but there is another uh, type of problem that we also need to uh, recognize when we see that uh, uh, certain uh, innovative uh, ideas or discoveries actually get into practice uh, uh, too quickly. And one uh, example could be uh, the uh, uh, intensive uh, glucose uh, uh, monitoring and management in uh, ICU patient populations that was recommended by a, a very uh, uh, respected uh, study in a high impact, very high impact uh, journal, and uh, very, uh, very quickly uh, spread uh, this practice. And uh, several years later, another larger clinical trial raised some concerns that uh, maybe it is really not as helpful in preventing um, uh, mortality uh, in the uh, ICU. And uh, at that point, uh, it was already uh, quite uh, widely uh, spread. And uh, certainly this is something that uh, we need to uh, 
uh, to be careful about that. There were some studies that actually suggested that there is a possibility that because of the too fast implementation of that particular uh, innovation, uh, the, uh, about uh, 26,000 patients uh, died in, in our ICUs. So this is a very staggering uh, number and certainly should uh, raise uh, concerns about the appropriate uh, speed. So it's innovation and the diffusion of innovation is uh, more, more, than, more than speed. We need to look at uh, other issues as well. And I can tell you that in our uh, study, uh, we uh, looked at uh, a number of uh, factors uh, uh, several years ago uh, that uh, define how, in that particular case, preventive care procedures uh, go into practice. And uh, this uh, study uh, became uh, much cited that it takes about 17 years to, on average to take preventive care procedures from the clinical trial. So it's not even from the uh, original basic uh, research, but from the clinical trial, from the success for clinical trial into practice, meaning that 50% uh, uh, of uh, practices actually uh, use them. So I always uh, warn people that uh, uh, when you go to the doctor's office, uh, don't complain about the old, better homes and gardens because uh, maybe that's actually a newer thing. So it is uh, sometimes uh, certain things uh, got into uh, practice very fast, others uh, uh, very slowly. And somehow the whole process needs appropriate revision. And I think that the health affairs issue is a landmark in that regard because it really puts the spotlight on the uh, demands of uh, of uh, the uh, uh, implementation process and the complexities of that process. So in this particular um, study, we looked at various models and we looked at the various malfunctions of the uh, uh, of this uh, you know, implementation dissemination process. And you, you can learn from, from both. And obviously, the Raja theory had a, a major, played a major role with the various waves of uh, adoption. Uh, and uh, it really uh, illuminated how uh, dissemination of innovation happens. And there have been a number of uh, refinements of, uh, of, of that theory over, over time. Uh, but I think that people realize that uh, there, are, there are some waves. And, and certainly, there is another. A trend that we uh, need to recognize that the knowledge as it becomes uh, practically valuable uh, goes through a, a, a series of steps of transformations. And I think that uh, this uh, uh, table, which uh, can be found in the, um, in the article and the journal issue, uh, gives uh, this uh, message that when you look at uh, innovation dissemination, you have to think about the uh, waves of adoption, but you can also, and you have to uh, think about the knowledge transformation uh, that uh, should parallel that because that's how it is uh, it, it, it is becoming a, a harmonious uh, and successful process. Obviously, the first uh, group is the, the, the pioneers, those who actually conduct the, the clinical trial. And after that, immediately after that, uh, the, uh, comes the question, so how much it is sustainable? What is the promise of that? And how do we develop the business model? How do get, we get the uh, supply? and so forth. And then the, the next uh, uh, step is when it goes to the pioneering group, a leading group, uh, uh, the larger group of institutions, and then gradually the mainstream of practice uh, takes it over. And then uh, at that point, uh, the, uh, we, we need to put more emphasis on the public health impact of uh, the innovation and also on the various ways to send the message that this is the right, uh, right practice. And then the final when it becomes the, um, the more complete. Uh, that's the point where we probably will worry about uh, a, a lot about the uh, uh, practice variations and also the underserved communities and their access uh, to state-of-the-art interventions. So with that note, I just want to mention the uh, summary of my, our recommendations. One is that the uh, certainly knowledge transformation needs gr much greater emphasis in everything uh, we do. And if we want to make a difference in the use of, uh, in the practical implementation of uh, biomedical research discoveries, clinical discoveries, we have to invest more in knowledge transformation. A large part of it will be electronic. So the uh, Office of the National Coordinator already recommends a number of standards to facilitate such exchanges, and we are fully supportive of that. Actually, we would like to see that uh, role uh, uh, being expanded. And certainly, as we move forward, we need to uh, phase these activities 
and help institutions to get, go through all the waves in an appropriate sequence as opposed to jumping into too quick implementation or being too long and too delayed in, in, in their efforts. So in that process, perhaps uh, some uh, measures of the capacity to change, which is such an important characteristic of successful organizations, uh, should be developed uh, to evaluate that as opposed to the steady uh, measures that we use today. So with that note, thank you again, House Affairs, and I'm looking forward to the next presentation. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and actually to follow Dr. Ballas, whose papers I read initially when I started out in informatics. Um, he's uh, well known, he and Dr. Chapman, who wrote that article. So I'm David Doerr from Oregon Health and Science University. And um, really, this is a nice sequence because in our paper, we looked at the degree to which data drives diffusion of innovation by focusing on three large health reform efforts, innovative delivery models. And um, we found really three things. One, that absolutely data is driving diffusion of innovation, but it's also incredibly a part of the innovations themselves in medicine, and that creates a lot of complexity for uptake and risks. And second, in these delivery models that um, people adopted technology to try and use this information, um, data and information more uh, effectively, they did a lot of adoption, but it did not nearly meet the need that they had. So there's still evolution that has to happen there. And three, that technical assistance was very helpful in getting these um, participants, the people adopting these innovations, unstuck from their data-driven problems, which we'll see were many. Um, oops, how did I do that? Okay. We are not good at IT in informatics, just FYI, so I just turned off the screen. Um, so really, this is a, a journey with two co-authors who are absolutely wonderful here. Uh, Dr. Julia adler Milstein, who's now at UCSF, worked on um, a study funded by the Commonwealth Fund on accountable care organizations, which are large collaboratives of healthcare entities that take on a population uh, the healthcare needs of a population in terms of both quality and cost. I looked at advanced primary care models where primary care practices that want to transform their care for a population, often in terms of also quality and cost of care, um, focusing on comprehensive primary care and the, the subsequent PLUS model that came out of CMMI the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. And uh, my work was also funded by the Commonwealth Fund. And then Deb Cohen, who actually you'll hear another talk about a group that she's involved with as well, Escalates, where she wrote about the evidence now, the, the, over, um, the, the endeavor funded by AHRQ that actually focused on improving heart health measures for small to medium primary care practices that didn't have as much experience in quality improvement. And so that we thought this was particularly good because these, uh, or it, these endeavors really uh, went across this diffusion curve. If you, the ACOs might be thought of as early adopters or even innovators. They're really trying to find new ways to do things. The advanced primary care self-selected. So these are practices that are probably on the early phase. And then um, the evidence now practices for a variety of reasons might be later majority uh, in terms of adoption of QI. And as we thought about this, each of the phases or issues related to fusion of innovation has data involved to some extent, from knowing about the innovations to being persuaded perhaps by your own data, should I do this or not, and then making that decision. But a lot of what we found was that in the implementation itself, data drove how the innovation was taken up and how it was ultimately successful or the challenges that it brought. The, I just wanted to make a quick statement here that um, there was also a lot of 
you can see from this table that describes them, there's a lot of technical assistance that's provided in the ACOs internally, but for um, CPC and CPC plus, the advanced primary care models, from organizations, intermediaries that actually help to do this, and they use data extensively too. And then in evidence now, it was set up such that cooperatives, seven cooperatives actually were helping even to extract the data in many cases to help drive the innovations forward, and that's really important. So what happened? First, we found that they used uh, they adopted technology extensively in these models um, and intensified their use of it in many cases to drive the innovation, both in terms of just actually doing the innovation, such as adopting and intensifying or modifying EHR use, to creating population-based registries that really stored all the information about particular conditions or needs for a population of patients so they could see how they're doing in full care gaps. And ACOs did this as well as advanced primary care that really focused on higher need populations through risk stratification, sort of identifying who's at high risk and then doing complex care management for that. And they too found that they needed to use a lot of health information technology to manage this data, to understand it, and to act on it efficiently. They also reached out to patients through use of patient portals. Unsurprisingly, evidence now expressed a number of concerns <laughs> with actually adoption. Um, most of them had EHRs, the vast majority. Uh, most of them were participating in federal programs like Meaningful Use, but they really struggled to um, modify their EHRs or um, exchange information. But that wasn't unique to them, even though they were later in the diffusion curve. Each of the initiatives reported that modifying their health information technology, especially electronic health record systems, the sort of point of care information systems that we use, was very difficult. Extracting and exchanging information, as Dr. Ballas just referenced, the work of ONC has been trying to improve this and still was a major problem and limited diffusion. And then actually trying to manage those populations through the registries was difficult. All of them also reported that they were absolutely exhausted from the number of changes that were expected from them and really pointed to the health information technology as a major barrier or a major source of that fatigue. On the bright side, the technical assistance was very helpful, and we see that they used a variety of technical assistance, including their peers, including online portals and forums where they could go to find out how they could improve. We use practice facilitation both in a general sense, we see this both in a general sense where they're helping the practices to get unstuck, but the practice facilitation in many of the endeavors needed more uh, expertise from HIT experts and others to get unstuck. So in all, in all data-driven diffusion was expected, and there was a lot of adoption in these, but it still wasn't nearly enough. And so focusing on getting this data out and making it so it can be shared or interoperable more easily is important. Making the programs more flexible so that you could really focus on what needs to be adopted. And then these technical assistant components were often pointed to as what helped to drive the success that they saw. Thank you so much. I'm going to begin with just a couple of questions of the panel. Um, Jim, you made a quick reference to reinvention as sort of the, the, the early literature on diffusion was really a one way. Um, this is now a different way of thinking about it. I just wonder if you could go a little deeper in that and what we, what, what we know about it. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Let's see, is yep. that on? Yep. yep. Um, when I say reinvention, what I mean are purposive changes made to an innovation by the developers of the innovation or other proponents like intermediaries who are trying to spread and support the innovation. So um, there, there are, uh, this is a tough one, uh, reinvention, and it's, and it's distinguished in part from what we also would term adaptation. Uh, those changes made by users of an innovation itself that might never be 
um, understood or acknowledged by the developers or proponents, things that just go on in clinical practice or maybe in state government. But reinvention is done purposively for the purpose of um, accelerating or broadening spread. And uh, this, this uh, you know, the phrase I think of most, most often in this, um, in this reference, Alan, is um, not letting um, the perfect be the enemy of the good. <laughs> because oftentimes it's taking something from clinical trials that's been externally validated through multiple research studies and um, coming up, reinventing that intervention such that it might achieve uh, less positive results to a degree, but it can reach and be supported and be affordable by many others. Uh, Andrew, you, you in your paper and your comments talked about too rapid adoption. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy in retrospect to see examples of that. I'm trying to figure out in real time how we can protect ourselves against that given the competitive, uh, you used a clinical example, but from a delivery system example, the competitive uh, advantage of adoption if, if something seems to be working well, even in a clinical setting, the payers are involved in uh, diffusion. So I, I can, it, as I say, you can see it in the rear view mirror. How can we see it better uh, looking forward? Right, I, I think that that's, that's an important and central question. I believe that uh, looking at the public health <coughs> impact of uh, innovations is a, uh, is a step that is frequently uh, skipped and uh, when it is skipped, then it really haunts every, everyone. So um, this is just another example that uh, the, the old uh, concept of uh, uh, implementation or adaptation is that read it and do it is really flawed. It, it, it never worked and it, it, it should never work. It, it, actually, the implementing an innovation is an iterative process. I wholeheartedly agree with the uh, concept of uh, reinvention. This, uh, the scientific discoveries, yeah, that's, that's, that can be a moment when, when you recognize something. But to have a, to develop a best practice, that is a process over time and we should respect every step of the process, not just the first. And David, you uh, dis describe the role of data and data analytics. If there's any phrase heard as often as innovation, it's data analytics. And um, <laughs> I, I do wonder, as you think, particularly in some of those models where there were, uh, in, all, in, in all instances, there are resource constraints, but particularly when you're thinking of practices trying to take on projects. Um, the degree to which the need or the expectation of the investment in data and data analytics crowds out some of the other things that organizations also need to do to change. So uh, I guess I'm trying to put the data in the context of the broader uh, uh, environment of, of uh, innovation. Yeah, so uh, that's an incredibly important aspect, especially for informatics, and as we are in sort of the hype cycle of big data and analytics, which is where is there real value, especially given the potential cost, because sometimes expertise for data analytics can be expensive, especially if you're a small or medium-sized practice that um, you don't have that locally, and actually acquiring it, we saw in several of the endeavors, was expensive. And often, actually, the technical assistants got them unstuck by saying, you don't need something really complicated to make this work. Your clinical in intuition can be good as a start, and then you can add simpler rules or algorithm or approaches as you develop the capacity, because there's also a time lag to really get those implemented and working well, especially when there's data extraction. And getting them unstuck so they were working on it inevitably improved the quality of the, pr of the innovation adoption overall um, without necessarily sacrificing that much of the quality <laughs> of the insight because many of our analytics approaches don't really provide that much of a jump in terms of ability to understand and to act better for patients and these populations. So, you know, I think their skepticism, I sort of share a little bit in terms of this is expensive, do I really need it? And we said, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good um, and don't get stuck because you don't have access to this or you can't implement it right away. 
We have time for a couple of questions uh, among the audience. Uh, we have microphones. I don't know if I'm going to let you ask. <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait for the microphone. Let everyone know. Yeah, no. Uh, Jeff Salberg with Peterson Center. Jim, I, I really, I've been waiting to ask you this question, and, and you uh, and you set me up well by showing the the social media uh, network. And I'm curious about advances in in network uh, effects, finding opinion leaders, boundary spanners. Does that change uh, Everett Rogers' theory of diffusion in the sense of find the innovators, early adopters, and the like? How do you blend those two together, or do you? Really good question. I don't think it, it changes uh, his main theoretical components, really. Uh, he published, he, he co-authored a book back in 1973 that was, uh, it, some people regard as the introduction of network analysis as applied to issues of diffusion for uh, innovations into communities, health innovations. So Ev had clearly been aware and thinking and trying to figure out network analysis. The tools weren't as sophisticated in the early 70s or mid 60s. Um, but you can do network analysis with paper and pencil and sometimes they did, so I don't think it um, really changes uh, his major components of his model, but there's been so much advance in network analysis, different network programs, and new research findings about the role of um, key influentials and how to find them. So I'm going to follow up. It's a little bit of a diversion, but, but it makes me want to ask also a question about um, we, we use this term diffusion. Each of you have talked some about clinical diffusion, some about sort of delivery system diffusion, some about policy diffusion. Um, I'd love to get each of you to give your take on commonalities, differences across those so that we're not using one model of diffusion for things that are fundamentally different, or maybe your sense is that there's actually uh, uh, mostly commonality across those. But I'd be really interested to know because all of those are important types of diffusion. <laughs> well, um, but to me, the, um, when you talk about different uh, uh, diffusion uh, challenges, uh, uh, the, um, the ultimate goal is to spread best practices even if they are uh, kind of presumed best, I mean, not yet uh, necessarily uh, proven and, and, and spread. Uh, so uh, we have the opportunity of uh, uh, looking at them only at, at the, the, like the policy or the technology, uh, just to see how they impact the actual best practice, which is the clinical practice. So at the end of the uh, day, we want to uh, see better patient outcomes, and everything should be measured uh, in relation to that. Other thoughts on the... Yeah, the, uh, this is sort of interesting. So um, I'm thinking through my experience, you know, one of the privileges I've had is to try and work from diffusion from policy to implementation and the technology and um, I, you know they, they work best when you can keep the overall goal in mind I think to improving health and, and well-being in populations and especially when there's efficiency that's needed limited resources um, but it is true absolutely that the, the way in which you shape diffusion in each of those is quite different. They speak a different language. The risks, you know, when you're trying to define a policy and then actually implement it to the point, um, you know that people will take it different ways and may, there might be gaming. Um, for technology, you absolutely know that, <laughs> that there will be unanticipated problems that will um, significantly sometimes stop um, what you're doing. And so to that end, I think having the expertise for people who not only know how to create, um, but also know how to implement or adapt as you go um, is, is really important from each of the domains. And that's why sort of this multifactorial technical assistance or multi-component seemed really important to us in that you could have people who could assist at the different levels levels or sort of different strategies if you're doing a, a large-scale innovation like we saw. Too many thoughts. Uh, Alan, you, you've 
heat it up really nice for the next panel. It's true. <laughs> because, it's uh, true. <laughs> but you get one last shot if you want it. Uh-huh. But uh, you're right. I, I, I'd just say that uh, I, uh, you could read the next set of papers that speakers will introduce as having at least as many commonalities as models for diffusion as they have uh, distinct uh, approaches. Very good. Okay, please uh, join me in thanking our kickoff panel. <laughs> We will move directly to our next, which we'll do, just as Jim said, <clears throat> looking at some different models. Um, come on up, I'll get, yes, I see. I'll, I'll give you enough room. So as they are coming up, uh, this is a, a segment on uh, some different examples and models of diffusion. Uh, Arlene Bierman is the director of the Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. She's a general internist and geriatrician. Uh, Rocco Perla, assistant professor of health services research at the University of Massachusetts, formerly president of Health Leads and director of the Learning and Diffusion Group at the Innovation Center at the uh, Center for Medicare Medicaid Services. Sarah Ono, uh, cultural anthropologist, specialized uh, training in feminist anthropology and assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the Oregon Health and Sciences University. I'll turn it over first to Arlene. Sorry to make you sit and then stand back up. I should have let you just stand here. Good morning. Um, it's really a pleasure to be, um, be here this morning. And I really want to acknowledge my cohort authors, because this was a really uh, true cross-agency effort at ARC, and the authors represented four different ARC offices and centers, so we diffused across our own centers with many decades of uh, cumulative experience in developing, implementing, and evaluating learning collaboratives. So learning collaboratives, collaboratives consist of multiple parties joining forces to have, um, to accomplish a great, um, sorry. Learning collaboratives consist of multiple parties joining forces to accomplish a goal and obtain or create knowledge. And they have many different purposes varying from really um, knowledge focused, for example, research collaboratives, to problem focused for quality improvement collaboratives. And the social activity of learning is a hallmark of collaboratives, which leverage and support peer-to-peer -peer learning, expert-to-peer learning, or both. And also, they, um, they have many different names that you know, knowledge networks, community of practices, and we use learning collaboratives as an umbrella terms. Learning collaboratives are increasingly used to hasten diffusion and implementation of um, innovation, evidence, and effective models of care. And um, the, actually, the other pr presentations on this panel really illustrate that really well. It was great to read the other papers. And um, are contributed to the uh, P4P, the Partnership for Patients at um, CMS, and for the Evidence Now Collaboratives provided technical um, assistance and brought together learning across the different Evidence Now Collaboratives. Um, ha, ha, what, despite all of this use, really the factors contributing to their success or failure are poorly understood. We've heard some about those earlier today. And the evidence on their effectiveness is really mixed. So ARC has sponsored collaborators for nearly two decades. I guess we were early adopters. And for this paper, we examined 15 of our collaboratives and identified the factors potentially contributing to their success or failure. So we started with the practice-based um, research network collaborative in the year 2000. Um, and our analysis invo informed by literature review was used to develop a taxonomy that can be used to support the development, evaluation, and study of learning collaboratives. And taxonomies really help us classify uh, di diverse knowledge and arrange and order it um, to really make sense out of the chaos. Um, so. What I'm going to do today is um, provide a brief overview of our taxonomy, 
And um, the next two slides show the primary and secondary elements of the arc learning collaborative taxonomy. And the, the taxonomy includes four primary elements, innovation, communication, time, and social systems, and 19 sec secondary elements, as well as 78 tertiary elements. So we really drilled down into the secondary elements in detail, and that's available in an in appendix online. Um, our primary elements map to Roger's diffusion of innovation framework. I guess he's the Bible. Uh, we started with him. And the secondary elements um, map to Wilder's collaboration factory inventory, uh, Roger's framework, as well as elements we identified in our analysis. So um, Dr. Deering already told us a lot about what is an innovation, but Rogers defined in innovation as an idea, practice, or object that is perceived as new by an individual or group. And innovations may be almost entirely composed just of information, so we can spread ideas. So we adapted Ro a Rogers def definition by expanding it to include the non-directed organic sharing of ideas and practices that in the end might or might not be objects of diffusion. We made this adaptation to allow for learning through the exchange of ideas. So what are our four um, secondary elements? The slide has the first two. Um, for innovation, um, the elements include the type of change. Um, collaboratives vary by the type of change being sought to advance knowledge, to improve quality or safety, or to develop or sharpen skills. So evidence now collaboratives seek to improve cardiovascular risk management in primary care by increasing performance on a bundle of four related evidence-based practice recommendations. Whereas on the opposite end of the type of change is the Medicaid Medical Directors Learning Network served as a forum for discussing state Medicaid drug coverage policies, among other things, that was really directed by the members of the network. So that takes us to the de degree of prescription, the extent to which the convener of the collaborative sets forth a predetermined agenda. The convener may also predetermine the aim as well as what, what is going to be diffused, or it could be open. So for example, the uh, Community Care Coordination Learning Network focused on implementing the pathways models to connect vulnerable populations to primary care, whereas the Medicaid Medical Directors um, Network determined their agenda. So scope refers to the breadth focus, which in turn refers to collaboration aims and geographic boundaries. So some have had a very narrow focus. The medication therapy management learning community sought really to improve care for patients at risk of complication from uncontrolled type 2 diabetes at uh, federally qualified health centers in Houston, Texas, whereas others had very broad scope, such as the Chartered Values Exchange Learning Network, which focused on improving quality in 24 regions across the U.S., representing a third of the U.S. population. Um, and again, part of the innovation is the supporting tools av available, which includes resources, products, technology to, su to improve the understanding of the innovation, increase it inf efficiency of its adoption and spread and provide other support. So the second primary element is communication, how when and where members of an, um, and conveners of collaboratives along those with in, invited experts or innovators share their messages, knowledge, resources, and insights in support of ensuring influence and goal attainment. So the elements, the secondary elements of communication include the motor venue, is it online, in person, the directionality, um, is it peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, expert-to-peer, or both? Frequency, how often do they meet? The degree of formality, um, that is the extent of structured convener orchestrated diffusion or how much is, um, you know, kind of uh, spontaneous. All ARC um, collaboratives have encouraged unstructured peer-to-peer -peer learning, which is, has been both informal and organic. And most um, our collaboratives have featured both informal, formal, and structured components. I'm just not going to be time to go through all of those. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just be quick on the next one. So the next one is um, the third elements are uh, time. It's important. The duration. Um, how long does it last? 
How long does it take to recruit members? Um, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's part of the uh, process, sometimes it, it's hard to get people on board. The rate of the adoption, and also sustainability. Is it, is it sustained? Do people think about sustainability? Is there a desire to sustain the collaborative and to be able to keep that um, you know, going um, explicitly or stopping it depending on your goals? And um, some of our collaboratives uh, stopped when funding ended, and others found ways to sustain themselves. And an example is we had an emergency department use learning collaborative that was sustained um, basically uh, when a, a member of the collaborative decided to keep it going. So social, we've ta heard a lot this morning about social systems, and that's a key element of uh, these networks. And um, the social nature of diffusion, learning and collaboration, and concept of systems, interrelated parts that make up a whole um, comprises social systems. And I think these will be familiar to you, the elements, and for time I won't go into detail, but the credibility of the convener, the characteristics um, characteristics of the members, are they all the same, are they a diverse group, governance, governance purpose of a shared vision, um, the culture of collaboration, the activity level and engagement of members, and also roles, processes, and structure. So for time, I can't go into all of that, but um, I'm going to just sum it up. So. Um, Collaborators really, as we move to learning health systems, can play a critical role in the development and evolution of learning health systems about implementing evidence and then generating evidence from practice about what works. We think our uh, taxonomy can support learning collaborative design, planning, budgeting, and evaluation, and identify characteristics of um, the innovation, time elements for implementation, communication strategies, elements of the social nature, and collaborators can play, um, so t the taxonomy can support learning collaborative design, um, can identify characteristics of the, can help, this, sorry, this, help decision makers make better investments. So it's expensive to do these, and it costs time and resources. So we think by thinking explicitly and working through these characteristics can help with design, but also inform research about what, what works and develop an, a research agenda about what we need to know about learning collaboratives to make them more effective and efficient. Um, and also what's really important is, you know, like any other complex interventions, have a standardized way of reporting um, them in the literature so that we can actually start making comparisons and learning across um, collaboratives. So thanks a lot, and I'm gonna stop there. Thanks, Alan, and thanks to Health Affairs for hosting today's event. Uh, when I first joined the Innovation Center back in 2011, I received one question over and over again. What is the Innovation Center? And my stock response was Congress established the Innovation Center for the purposes of testing new delivery and payment reform models that would reduce program expenditures without negatively impacting the quality of care that beneficiaries received. And then they would say, no, like, really, what do you do? Um, <laughs> And what I realized was that the Innovation Center is really a commitment that the country is making around testing any new idea, insight, or model before scaling it more broadly across the country. Now, implied in that commitment is the sober realization that no model is going to get it right out of the gates. Until you test a model with real patients, in real health systems, with real payers, in real communities, you just have huge blind spots that you can't see. And you risk scaling unanticipated consequences. And so the opportunity that the Innovation Center provided to learn alongside the market allowed us to minimize those risks because, let's be honest, healthcare is complicated. Now, the, there's been a lot written and debated about the Innovation Center and its models, 
But the story of the early lessons learned during the startup phase has never been told. And so that was a story that we wanted to tell in this issue. And we convened a number of uh, early former CMMI leaders uh, to hold that mirror up and to be honest with ourselves about what worked, what didn't, and to ask the question, you know, was, was there stuff that we learned that others might find um, really important, especially given the future direction of the Innovation Center? And we, we came together and we identified four key lessons. And I'm gonna share those right now. They're the architecture for the paper. The first, and I'm not sure we truly appreciated this at the time, but the role that CMS carves out for itself relative to models in the market is critical. It's not one size fits all, and it's not black and white. I think about the Healthcare Innovation Awards grants. In that particular model, CMS's role was that of, of an innovation catalyst. We weren't prescriptive, we didn't tell anyone what to do. The, all the ideas were market generated. And to give you an idea of how receptive the market was to that model, we received 7,000 letters of intent and over 1,000 applications. So there was this intense interest with a little bit of uh, infusion of capital into the market. Now, compare that to the role that CMS played in the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative. It's totally different. Um, CMS in that model was a convener of multiple payers, both public and private, that were trying to incentivize better primary care in the country. And so the, that taxonomy ends up becoming a really important consideration relative to how the government interacts with the market. The second learning was that CMMI is not just designed to test models, it was also designed to learn. And in many ways, I think we were learning how to learn often in real time. And some of the models did really well, some did poorly, others washed out in between, but the one thing we never had a shortage of was uh, direct and critical feedback. And we got that feedback in a number of different ways. The first was that models, participants would drop out. That's pretty direct. And we saw that happen early on with model one of bundle payments. Um, the second way is participants would defect from one model to another. And so we saw that with Pioneer ACOs transitioning to the lower risk Medicare shared savings program. And then third is that the participants would stick it out with us, uh, but all along the way continue to provide really critical feedback. All that information helped shape the future generation of models um, and was uh, in important learning for us. The role that public sector leadership was able to play to have that broader perspective and to shape some of that learning and see some of the patterns that were emerging ended up being a critical facet of the work. The third lesson was around the time needed to evaluate the return on investment and the impact of models. It was just too short. I mean, think about what these models are trying to do. They're trying to transform a segment of the market. There are still competing interests. There are perverse incentives that are out there. Um, and one of the things that we learned is that the basic functioning operationally of the, of the participants, um, well, let me just put it this way, there was a steep learning curve. Basic budgeting, accounting, um, many were dealing with legacy IT uh, systems, so just data procurement and reporting ended up being a real challenge. So in many ways, given the degree of disruption and transformation we were looking to, to achieve, um, a year-to-year -year ROI that was gonna be breakthrough just seems unrealistic. Even a three to four year time frame seemed unrealistic now looking back. Um, the fourth lesson to me I think was the most important, and that was the idea that innovation isn't always about more models or new models. Sometimes it has to be about better integration and coordination of existing models. Now, I spent four years at CMS and I did a distance commute between Boston and Baltimore. I used the same airport shuttle service every week. I got to know a lot of the drivers, one in particular. He was a 70-year-old veteran who walked with a terrible limp. He'd have to stop the van halfway to CMS, get out, walk around the van, because sitting for that long was unbearable. He later told me that he needed a hip replacement, but he couldn't maneuver through the VA. Um, his paperwork got lost, they couldn't validate his um, services, and he didn't have the time to deal with um, all of that administrative stuff. If he didn't work, he didn't eat. Today there are 48 models supported through the Innovation Center, but when we started, there were zero. Somewhere between zero and 48 models, we kind of lost this guy, and I think we, he's not alone. Um, the solution to a fragmented healthcare system can't be a fragmented innovation environment. And so I think there's real leadership opportunity right now to think about how we thoughtfully reduce the administrative burden in the system, at the same time putting the needs of beneficiaries and patients first. Um, 
the federal government is always going to be a key actor in healthcare. And I think what we realized as we went through and, and did some reflection on through the paper is that the question is, will it and its private sector partners commit to learning their way forward for the next phase of the work ahead? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sarah Ono, and I'm here as a member of the Family Medicine Department at Oregon Health and Science University. Thank you to Health Affairs and the team for the invitation to be here today and the assistance on this article, which improved with, with your careful consideration and insight. I am here representing an amazing team of collaborators who are led by Deborah Cohen, who is the PI of Escalates, which is the National Evaluation for Evidence Now. Evidence Now pops up a couple places in this issue, and if you're not familiar with it, it is an ARC-funded initiative, and it's a big effort. Evidence Now is the largest study that ARC has funded, and it has the potential to give us information on a wide range of topics. The target is cardiovascular risk reduction. It focuses on aspirin, blood pressure, cholesterol, and smoking cessation, the ABCS. And it is also about the challenges that are facing small, rural, primary care practices all over the country. And I said rural, but there also are a whole bunch of them in New York City. So it, it definitely has adaptability in a number of environments. These primary care practices are struggling to keep up with the changing evidence, new technology, payment models, policy. And if there are any doctors in the room, you know, you're still trying to have a meaningful encounter with your patients at those appointments. So my training is as an anthropologist. And the questions around how practices change, how practice culture changes, is something that is particularly interesting to me. The ability to get practices to a point where they can do ongoing quality improvement is no small task. Oh, and there's the list of the amazing authors who worked on this with me. This is a map of the United States. And I know it may be small for some of you who are in the back, but hopefully you can see that there are states that are color blocked. Those are the seven regions that are participating in evidence now. The dots are the practices, and this is at the zip code level. So if there's even one practice in a zip code, there's a dot. And in several of these, there are, are many practices. And I like this map. I've been looking at this map for a while because it gives you a sense of what kind of diffusion we're talking about. And this is in the single initiative of Evidence Now. This is an opportunity to, in some cases, cover an entire state. If you look at, at North Carolina, at Virginia, at Oklahoma, they really have dots just about everywhere. So what this is, it's seven cooperatives. The eighth grantee is the evaluation that I'm here representing. Seven cooperatives touching 12 states. They've recruited and are working with over 1,500 practices, which translates to about 5,000 clinicians and 8 million patients. So we are working on this diffusion. And it is, it is showing itself to be possible. In each, of these ex in each of these areas, external support needed to be provided to practices in order to, to support the technology that David Dorr has talked about, the ability to access, extract data, practice facilitators to help with quality improvement, how to take data, understand it, get new evidence, and figure out what to do with it. It's, bu it's building skills. Um, and another piece of this that has become very interesting to me personally is this idea of the model of healthcare extension. It's not an entirely new idea. It's something that we have taken from agriculture and the cooperative extension service model that exists in every state has sustained for 100 years and has had a number of impacts more than, than I can fully address today or in this paper. It is building on the work of, of big thinkers who will hopefully continue to, to write about this um, and pull out some of the historical pieces of how we got to this point um, because it's, it's incredibly interesting. And I was told my slides might be slow. 
Well, if it comes up, one of the things we did was we looked at the empirical data, there it is, the empirical data that was generated through these seven examples, these seven cooperatives. Because in order for them to reach over 200 practices in their state or region, they had to put in place something that was a healthcare extension. They had to put together a network of partners and organizations and people on the ground in communities in order to access this many practices in less than a year. It wasn't a small task. And so what, what we did when we looked at that, and we were looking at early and baseline data, is we identified that they needed support around health technology, using electronic medical records, their ability to, to really know what was there, know what was possible, and get the information that they needed so that it could be applied for quality improvement. Along with that, there was this idea of practice capacity building, and that's where the culture piece comes into play. It's how do you keep small practices with three people from burning out trying to learn new skills? How do you um, get them interested and energized and seeing how this benefits their patients? Developing motivation and resiliency. And the third piece is really around making community connections trying to figure out what the resources are. And this is a piece that comes directly from the agricultural model of having extension agents, having people who are embedded in local communities, who know the practitioners, who understand what the local issues are, and are able to adapt their approach with those factors in mind. What the model does is it sets up this bi-directional communication. So you get it from the top down, the policies get rolled out, the evidence comes out of research centers, but you also are able to tap into what's happening as far as local innovation, what small practices are figuring out that works. And like Arlene said, you can create learning collaboratives, opportunities for these individual practitioners to interact with each other, whether it's in person or we now have all of these virtual opportunities where you can asynchronously connect online, trying to really capitalize on what's possible. And the thing about evidence now that's been so phenomenal to watch is that all of these pieces that are talked about in different articles start to come together in this large scale experiment. And the last slide is really just to again acknowledge that this is an idea that is coming out of agriculture. I'm from Portland, Oregon, and we're big on recycling and reusing things. And if we don't have to rebuild it, I think that that is probably a benefit. The other thing about this is there's a possibility to create economies of scale. This is not an inexpensive effort, as others have said. We invest a lot of money, the government invests money and time in these initiatives. And the idea that we aren't capitalizing on the work that's already been done is something I, I really hope is kept at the front of our minds and that putting an infrastructure like this in place may be a way to help facilitate that um, so that we are able to continue to grow and not just sort of circle um, over and over again. So again, I appreciate your time and inviting me. Thanks for keeping time. Thank you. And I'll start off with a couple of questions. Uh, Rocco, I'm interested in the diffusion element. <clears throat> you talked a lot in the paper and today about the lessons. You had this unique statute that permits uh, replication, adoption based on actuarial determination. That may have been part of also the impetus for fast evaluation. So I just wonder if you could add, based on the panel this morning, some of the thoughts within, I know you can't speak for your co-authors, but some of the thoughts within the center um, reflecting on not just the innovations themselves, but what you learned about diffusion. Mm -hmm. That's, thank you, Alan, that's a great question. Um, so this is one of the things that we talked about inside that we didn't talk about a lot outside. Uh, there was a, a theorist called uh, Peter Rossi who developed the concept of the iron law of evaluation. And one of the things we began to recognize in the work that we did is that, as I mentioned in my remarks, some uh, participants did, it, did well, some didn't do so well, and others washed out in the middle. When you fold that distribution over, the net impact is zero. So typically, the impact that you're gonna see with any large type of health or social related program that's spread across multiple geographies is just based on distributional statistics, a, a, a tendency for a, a net impact of, of nothing. So the, the challenge that we had, and we recognized this immediately, was the goal was to identify who was doing well and who wasn't 
doesn't. And in the collaborative sense, you, you have access to all of that information. So we can begin to really understand and unpack um, uh, where the opportunities are to improve because it is an iterative process. Um, it's why we had a rapid cycle evaluation group was built on that, that principle of learning our way forward to try to fight against the net impact of, of, no, of no influence at all. Thank you. Um, Sarah, it's notable to have uh, the Eastern Plains of Colorado and Manhattan in, a similar, in the same project. Um, I'm thinking, uh, it, again, if you could sort of reflect back on some of the elements of diffusion and, and some of the um, <clears throat> taxonomy that Arlene presented, um, how that difference plays out in terms of uh, some of the dimensions, obviously the ability to convene is different, but uh, trust, methods, uh, how, how do those differences play out when you're looking at something uh, that's, uh, that, that is touching places as diverse as those? Right, in a myriad of ways. Um, the one thing I think that ARC was incredibly smart about was putting in place a national evaluation. Not just because I get to be a part of that team, but because what that does is it enables us to have a record of what was done in seven very distinct and different places so that we're able to, to not only look across at what, what comes out of all of this, but also to really focus in on specific areas and be able to pull from a single region or across regions to say like, what happened with solo practices that have three people in them? What happened with rural practices? What happened with practices that it, either at the beginning or along the course of the project were incorporated into a health system? How are those needs different? So it was just incredible foresight, I think, to be able to, to put a mixed method study of this scale in place so that as we go forward and, and do keep following us, there's a lot to come, um, we'll be able to look at, at those variations. Great. Thanks. Uh, we have time for a few questions as well for this group. These are major initiatives that are complex. And if you don't ask questions, I will. But yes, let's. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Randy Siebel, Cleveland. Um, the, these presentations have been terrific, both of the sessions so far. I have something that I haven't heard, though, is positive deviance. Um, uh, sort of the Jerry Sternan approach, which is really sort of what we're doing in Cleveland. And when you get as much data as we get about u metrics that were defined by the providers to improve care outcomes and cost, um, that we use the data to look at the top decile, top whatever, and talk with them and try to disseminate it. But And I haven't seen a lot of sort of um, commitment to that kind of a model, but it, but I, I think it's sort of interesting. I'll, I'll jump in. I, the, it sort of speaks to the previous point. The the challenge is the positive deviants are lumped in with the negative deviants, right? So if the if the goal is to look at this from an actuarial or a cost benefit perspective to the trust fund, that's a tough thing. But your point is exactly right. I mean, that's what we were trying to do with the innovation center is identify um, those positive deviants and uh, and build that into the work that we were doing. Either if it was with Pioneer ACOs or the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative, my colleague Will Schrank, who oversaw the evaluation uh, team was, you know, that was one of the things we talked about a lot, is, is being able to harvest that learning from the myriad of models that we were testing. And I would also say across different models, right? So there's the positive deviance within like a Pioneer ACO, but there's also positive deviance within a primary care initiative. And because the systems are so related, there are often lessons that can cut across different models um, as we think about the work moving forward. Yeah, and you know, yeah. just with the evidence now, collaboratives, if you look at, there were four measures that they needed to improve on. And some didn't actually need help, which were doing really well. So I think learning where do you need to target. But on the other hand, is nobody was doing well on all of them, right? So And some were doing better on some than others. So it's not like it's one organization that's the best. It's how do you share that learning for the posit positive deviance across multiple practices and settings. Right. So, so let me, uh, let me close with a question about goal setting. Um, <clears throat> Rocco, the first example you gave was <clears throat> you open up and you get 7,000 applications. Um, <clears throat> but my general sense with what all of you have described are still um, <clears throat> the, the top level goals 
seem to mostly be set centrally, you may have a willingness to have significant variance um, in methods or uh, fidelity to a model to the extent one exists. To what degree is goal setting by the participants in the initiative um, a central part of successful diffusion? I think they're absolutely critical. And I'll, just from the time at, uh, that I spent at the Innovation Center, um, one of the first things that we would do with a group of participants, and I remember this distinctly with the Pioneer ACOs, was uh, come up with a goal. Because without that goal, you never know if you're heading in the right direction or not. Um, and that was probably one of the most uh, challenging situations, is to get a group of stakeholders across multiple systems agree on a goal for a program at national scale. So I still remember the goal in my head. It was by year three of the Pioneer ACOs, we wanted 100% of them to qualify for population-based payments uh, based on their quality and cost performance. And everything was engineered toward that objective. The primary levers that we wanted to influence, the changes that we were going to try, how we were going to evaluate our work moving forward. And then the second point that I think is absolutely critical is um, the, the, the high-level goal also has to be able to vision that we set for the system. So uh, many of you know about the Comprehensive Primary Care Initiative, and the first year the results came out, and they were, you know, we weren't sure whether or not they were truly cost neutral. If you added in the elevated care management fee, there was some question about whether or not it meant statistical significance. And so I can remember having a discussion with people thinking, okay, well, let's, ima let's imagine it wasn't statistically significant. Does that mean we're going to abandon comprehensive primary care now? So th there has to be this idea of both the vision, a clear goal, and engineering everything around that. And I would just add that I'm, I'm currently at a stage where I'm, I'm getting to interview practice facilitators, the people who are on the ground in direct contact with practices. And, and the first thing they'll tell you is, there are the goals of the initiatives and there are the goals of practices. And part of my job is to figure out where those can intersect and, and to be able to meet a practice where it's at. Um, in this larger context, they're having to, to adjust to payment, value-based payment, they're having to hit meaningful use. Um, a lot of things are coming, coming at them. And so listening for what those local goals are is critical, and I think that's part of why the extension model is compelling to me. It really is uh, a conversation that goes from, from the ground up. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm gonna step back and actually give a little different perspective because I think there's different kinds of collaboratives with different purposes. Mm -hmm. So clearly, to, to scale, you know, performance or better care delivery, that needs a clearly directed goal. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's collaboratives like research collaboratives where you're trying to develop methods. How do you study complex patients with multiple right. you know, chronic conditions where it might be more open-ended or the Medicaid uh, medical directors is a good example where they, we didn't define the agenda, they defined it things that they needed to learn and share from each other. On the other hand, I think evidence now is really a model not only of like improving cardiovascular risk management, but how how do we learn how to make it work? And I think more and more we need to do that parallel of studying what works in terms of implementation as we implement, sort of like the CMS rapid cycle evaluation. Because we, we're doing this, what we're doing in terms of implementing these, these collaboratives is also, um, we need evidence for that and how to do that best and most effectively. And I think that's where we need to move the science is kind of learn what, as we implement and then share all these learnings. So after the break, we're going to go deep into a number of <clears throat> examples of diffusion and what we've learned from them. But uh, we'll take 10 minutes before that. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <clears throat> if our first session was theory and our second session was how that theory plays out at the macro level, this session starts to move us more directly into specific examples of innovation, some really interesting uh, stories, and I'm very pleased to be able to uh, t turn <coughs> the conversation this morning in that direction. We'll hear from Rebecca Oni, founder and CEO Emerita of Health Leads, which uh, is, a, is a nationally recognized leading organization at the intersection of social determinants, population health, and healthcare uh, delivery. We'll be hearing from Brian Castle, who is a palliative care research director at the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine. James Schuster, chief medical officer uh, for Medicaid, special needs and behavioral services at the University of Pittsburgh Medical uh, College Insurance Division. And Maureen Mavernack, who wrote the Narrative Matters piece in this month's issue, a board, uh, who's board certified in family medicine and geriatrics. Uh, it's my pleasure to turn it over first to Rebecca.
Thank you, Alan. Not long ago, an adolescent patient uh, walked into a major health system not far from here, losing weight, losing weight. And just as the physicians were huddled up figuring out which blood tests and metabolic panels to run, one of our health leads advocates asked out loud, do you think the patient might be hungry? And in fact, the patient had been kicked out of his housing just a few weeks prior and just literally hadn't eaten in weeks. He said he was so relieved that someone finally asked me. And the article that we have written in this issue of Health Affairs is to some degree about an operational model for addressing patient social needs, but really is much more so about the question of how do we change the understanding of what actually counts as health care? Why does ordering blood tests count, but asking a patient if he's hungry doesn't? And I think for all of us engaged in healthcare transformation, this is a critical question. How do we actually transcend the status quo to create a new normal? In this case, my co-authors and I chronicle Health Leads' odyssey in pursuit of this aim, a healthcare system that addresses patients' social needs as a standard part of quality care. I have to say that, you know, as many of you know, case studies have many limitations, but one of the benefits of obsessively focusing on a single project over a long period of time is that there are certain learnings that emerge only through contextual shifts, and there were many of these. That's what happened here. We did a lot of really hard learning over 20 years as health leads evolved through five phases of diffusion, which we show through the number of patients that we reached, which is the blue line, and the number of healthcare institutions that we reached, the orange line. Phase one was really about testing and learning, and honestly, this phase was just a total mess. <laughs> we were experimenting with all different ways to try to impact the way that poverty shaped health outcomes. And what's most important about this phase was less what we did, but more how long it took. It was 12 years. And part of that was about our fixating on how to actually create a model, but part of it was that the sector honestly just wasn't ready for this notion of health. In 2008, there were only 28 patient-centered medical homes in this country. Country. Phase two was about model standardization. By 2009, the triple aim had been introduced and ACOs launched, and we felt compelled to begin to standardize our model. The idea is that when patients came into the clinic, they'd be screened for unmet social needs. The physician or other provider could then refer them to food or heat or other resources the same way they would a subspecialty referral. The patient and the advocate would then navigate together to access those resources in the existing landscape, and finally the advocate would close the loop with the provider to enable better, critical, uh, better clinical care. Phase three brought model replication. In 2012, the US Supreme Court substantially upheld the ACA, and within a couple of years, we had had 1,400 expansion requests from health systems as millions of newly insured patients presented not just with untreated chronic conditions, but also with significant unmet social needs. And we set out to replicate our model quickly with about $16 million in funding from the Robert Johnson Foundation and an additional $19 million from other funders, including the Physicians Foundation, Skoll Foundation and others. Almost immediately, we realized that we had entirely the wrong plan. With 70 million Medicaid patients in this country, Health Leads' goal of reaching 175,000 patients over four years seemed laughably small. And we quickly had to recognize that we had gotten it all wrong. So in phase four, we actually ditched the replication plan and instead began to provide tools, data, and best practices to health systems and payers um, to enable them to be able to address the social needs of patients in their own local context. The number of health leads patients during this period of time that we reached directly plummeted, but the number of healthcare institutions we reached increased exponentially from a couple of dozen to literally 2,300 institutions in 2017. And in phase five, which was the last one, we began to catalyze broad adoption. Social determinants of health, as you know, is hot stuff today. CMS has launched um, its first two models, including social needs and care delivery and payment models informed by health leads learning. And we see today that VC firms are beginning to do due diligence on social care models. Commercial payers are grappling with the reality that up to 40% of patients who screen positive for unmet social needs have 
um, commercial insurance. We see state medical societies like the North Carolina Medical Society beginning to prepare its members to address social needs in the context of value-based care. So very quickly, what do we learn regarding the diffusion of innovation in healthcare? First, a constant focus on a clear aim is essential and to stick with it over a long period of time. The key here is the focus on the aim, not on replicating the model. This inoculates innovators against falling too much in love with their own idea, whatever it is, which in turn jeopardizes broad adoption. Philanthropy also has to understand that the only thing that's sacred is the aim and the values that enable you to achieve it. Everything else can and will change. Second, invest in model testing so much more than you would think because this ultimately enables responsiveness to market shifts. Diffusion pathways, as have been talked about today, are nonlinear, especially in complex systems like healthcare. And because the market and policy context can decelerate or accelerate diffusion, a deep investment in the pilot phase is key to be able to seize the opportunities to go big when they arise. To put a fine point on this, as, as Rocco Perla mentioned in an earlier paper, CMS usually thinks about testing models for for three to five years. We were in the pilot phase for, tw for 12 years. And finally, innovators and their investors have to be willing to cede control of the model as fast as possible after the testing and standardization phases. I'll be honest, we at Health Leads never ever felt like we perfected the model. But to achieve our aim, we had to listen to our clinical partners like Contra Costa Health System or Kaiser Permanente, who compelled us to evolve to a more flexible and a more diffusible approach. And for Health Leads to cede control of our model, we needed philanthropy to cede control of Health Leads, holding us accountable for our aim rather than a rigid set of grant objectives. I just want to say that despite all this learning, this story is still a cliffhanger with the end unknown. Will addressing social needs be a fad, or is the health system at last coming to terms with what actually drives health and what its patients know to be true? as these data from recent focus groups in Charlotte, North Carolina show. Two groups, one of African American Democratic women and one of white Republican women were asked, if you had $100 to spend in investing in health in your community, where would you spend it? What's remarkable is that they know you spend one third of your money on health care, two thirds on everything else, and despite the political differences, their investments are identical, 19% in affordable housing, 25% in access to healthy food, 14% in access to affordable childcare, the question is, our country may be fractured when it comes to health care, but is it or could it be united when it comes to health? Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me to Health Affairs. My name is Brian Castle. I'll be speaking today about palliative care representing the Palliative Care Leadership Centers and the Center to Advance Palliative Care and my co-authors. So for those of you who don't know, specialist palliative care is a relatively new domain that's been carved out in the trajectory of serious illness care. It adds a crucial layer of support to patients and families. It is essentially an interdisciplinary effort that requires teams of specialists to work together effectively to prevent and treat suffering and pain, to clarify prognosis of the patient and to clarify goals of care, to communicate that effectively with the patient, with the family, with the care teams, um, to address the whole biopsychosocial spiritual continuum of issues for the patient and the family, and to bridge the gap between uh, quote unquote curative care and quote unquote end of life care in our hospitals and elsewhere. In the US, palliative care is a distinct thing from hospice care. For example, there is no revenue stream specific to palliative care as there is to hospice care under the Medicare hospice benefit. The field could essentially be said to have launched in the mid-1980s when several palliative journals uh, were created, when the subspecialty of palliative medicine was recognized in the UK uh, 18 years before it was recognized in the US. Um, and the first comprehensive program was founded by Declan Walsh at the Cleveland Clinic. Over the ensuing 30 years, what we see is a very um, remarkable adoption, a voluntary adoption of this high revenue, uh, I'm sorry, high value, low revenue. <laughs> It's a crucial thing to get wrong. Um, sometimes we, we say what we wish for, and uh, not, not what really is. 
Um, so it's a remarkable uh, trajectory of adoption of a uh, high touch, um, very personable, um, high value but low revenue form of healthcare in the US. You can see it increasing there from um, about one quarter to three quarters of US hospitals with 50 or more beds, essentially tripling over those 15 years that are depicted in the slide. Uh, the lower uh, line depicts the number of hospital teams that were trained by, through one method, the palliative care leadership centers, which is a team-to-team -team, uh, training and uh, educational program from the Center to Advance Palliative Care that we'll describe in more detail, so that two-thirds of hospitals with palliative care today have at some point sent a team through this PCLC, the Palliative Care Leadership Center training. Um, to describe all of the purposeful work that the Center to Advance Palliative Care and others have done to advance the field of palliative care in the US, it's useful to depict this using the Prochaska and DiClemente stages of change model and to talk about moving um, whatever level of entity you want to talk about, whether it's a hospital or a health system or individual providers from pre-contemplation to contemplation to determination to preparation um, to, to activation and maintenance, et cetera. And each of those crucial steps in growth and um, moving forward need to be addressed through dissemination, through technical assistance, through mentoring, um, and through uh, the building up of the field and connecting new adopters with those who have adopted previously in the field. The one I want to talk about in depth that I think is lacking in a lot of dissemination work is the action step. And this is where the palliative care leadership centers really have their work to help leaders who have committed to starting palliative care programs in their hospitals and health systems to do it well, to do it quickly, and to not fail. The Palliative Care Leadership Center initiative was first funded as a lot of the innovation and dissemination work in the palliative care field was by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and in using the Center to Advance Palliative Care at Mount Sinai as the central hub, creating a set of other hubs or intermediaries around the country that were centers of excellence that were recognized already as early adopters and innovators themselves, geographically dispersed, each of which had a characteristic that others would kind of come to in addition to being geographically close. For example, cancer center-based palliative care leadership centers or those that were affiliated closely with hospice or those in faith-based nonprofit health systems. And the goal of these is really to get over the operational uh, hurdles to make sure that the team is making its case clearly and effectively to hospital leaders and health system leaders and to take all of their aspirations and put them into concrete, achievable goals, and then mentoring them over a year to achieve them, to use data effectively to make their case and then to measure and evaluate their progress and what more remains to be done, and for themselves to become leaders in their own health systems. So the leadership from Mount Sinai, the leadership from the hubs, and then creating leadership within these health systems that then further promulgates uh, the palliative care principles and practices throughout their health systems, which is not an easy task to overcome complacency and resistance in this area throughout hospitals in the US. So online preparation for didactic uh, knowledge, two to three day in-person training, which is very intense and exhausting, which ends with this concrete set of goals that then form the framework for the mentoring over the following year. So two thirds of hospitals now in the US have gone through this that have had palliative care, uh, palliative care leadership center training. I would like to say that we wish we had written this article after having listened to all the theories and models and other case studies that are described in the journal and the briefing. Um, it is such a, unique laboratory for high value, low revenue um, care in the US. There's so much more that could be said and done about the diffusion of palliative care innovation across the US. Um, so we'd welcome those of you um, who are here to contact us and to work further on this field to understand what has been done and what has worked and what remains to be done. Thank you.
thank you, welcome, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in the uh, in the journal and in this presentation. So I'm James Schuster. I'm with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center uh, Division of Insurance Services. UPMC is a large integrated uh, payer and provider system uh, based in Western uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, as part of this study, I'd, uh, which was conducted through the UPMC Center for High Value Healthcare, which is a research and grants arm in the insurance division, and Community Care, which is a behavioral health managed care organization that manages services for about a million Medicaid members in Pennsylvania. So uh, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the results of an intervention that uh, we did, and then for a bit also about the uh, diffusion and innovation. And certainly trying to improve services that our patients and members receive is a key part. We've been just as challenged as everybody else by the 10 to 20 year time frame for uh, implementing uh, evidence-based care. So we are really uh, pleased by this forum and work. So we worked on implementing behavioral health homes and they're really a health home model for individuals with serious mental illness. And we did that because, as we all know, individuals with serious mental illness die significantly younger than average individuals in the country, and the primary causes of their death are related to cardiovascular disease, COPD, diabetes, and other complications largely from smoking and obesity. And actually, many of the providers whom we helped to fund came to us and said, behavioral health providers came to us and said, we work with a lot of the individuals with serious mental illness, a lot of our patients die young, and we're not really sure how to engage and help them. They often aren't very engaged with their primary care physician and we're not really sure what we should do or how we can best serve them. So we, uh, there wasn't really a key uh, comprehensive evidence-based model for how these providers could address this issue. But we did try to pull information from s several interventions that did have some evidence base, either in this population or, or in other populations. So the first, there was some evidence certainly that placement of a, a nurse focused on physical health issues in a behavioral health setting helped engage people in primary care and enhance the rate of preventive services. So we put that into our model. The second is there's lots of evidence obviously about the impact of self-management tools in terms of helping people manage chronic illnesses. Uh, third was there's significant evidence, particularly in oncology, but also other medical specialties about the value of health navigators or wellness coaches. So we included that in the model as well. And then the fourth piece is there's obviously many new innovations use registries to help people structure their intervention and, and monitor their implementation over time. So we also helped the providers build a registry. And then we reached out to the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI, for funding uh, to evaluate the intervention, and were successful and got lots of great support and advice from them during this, uh, during this intervention and assessment. So what we did was we created two models to really test against each other. Our hope was that both models would be effective. Both models included wellness coaching and the use of a registry. One model also included a wellness nurse in the provider setting working on physical health issues, and the other intervention including, included using self-management toolkits and other self-management strategies with individuals. We used a cluster randomized design at 11 sites, and the research participants were all enrolled in Medicaid, 21 years uh, or older, diagnosed with a serious mental illness, and were receiving services, primarily case management or peer support services at those providers. We were able to pull data from a number of different data sources, including a number of self-report measures that people completed through the study, a number of secondary administrative sources, both physical, behavioral, and pharmacy data. And we also used a very structured learning collaborative model for implementation. We heard some discussions earlier about the uh, different types of learning collaborative models. We used the learning collaborative model developed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and we used it with a number of other projects. And our experience with this reflected our other experience, which is that it's very important for the learning collaborative model to be very structured, both in terms of what the goals are and what the expectations are in terms of the uh, participants. What we found in terms of uh, outcomes was that there was a very significant increase in both uh, 
arms in terms of patient activation. We use the patient activation measure to assess that, and uh, increases in the patient activation measure are typically associated with improvements in utilization and improvement in costs. So we were uh, pleased to see that. There was certainly greater increase in activation for women in the provider supported part. So the women enjoyed working with the nurses, the men preferred to work on their own with self-directed tools. Um, both arms had led to significant increase in frequency of visits with both primary care and other community-based uh, physicians. And there was an improvement in perceived mental health status and a small decline in perceived physical health status. And we don't entirely know the reason for that, but we hypothesize that it's at least partly because uh, providers were now talking with individuals about their physical health status and physical health challenges. We've now worked extensively to diffuse the, the innovation. Um, we have created wellness, uh, engaged wellness champions at different sites and used a train the trainer approach, to, especially to disseminate the uh, wellness coaching approach. We actually have expanded now to 43 additional providers uh, across the state. Uh, and, and have used a similar learning collaborative model to support implementation. And we've also used to pay for performance contracts to support implementation as well, especially to support the uh, nursing piece, which is an incremental expense for the providers. And we were recently fortunate in securing an additional uh, dissemination and implementation award from PCORI, which we were going to use to revise and implement the model in uh, methadone treatment programs for individuals with opioid use disorders and um, in residential treatment programs for adolescents with behavioral challenges. So we think the study findings can certainly inform national efforts to avoid or reduce uh, mortality in individuals with serious mental illness. We certainly uh, intend to continue to monitor the impact of this work. And we think also this has been a useful model for diffusing new models into behavioral health care settings. And we think can apply to other settings as well for individuals with disabilities. Thank you. Wow, I am so honored to be here today. Thank you to the staff and editors of Health Affairs. My name is Maureen Mavernack, and my article in this month's Narrative Matters of Health Affairs is rethinking the traditional doctor's visit. It discusses a model of care that I was fortunate enough to pilot and participate in in a rural setting in a remote location in the Central Valley of California having previously led such a model with inner city patient populations. My narrative specifically discusses shared medical appointments, a block that we called Juntos Podemos, or Together We Can. This group, which I ran with a health coach, consisted of six to seven weekly sessions. Each session covered a specific topic, such as emotions, medication, uh, complications, nutrition, and exercise. The rudiments of the appointment were patients would come in, consent would be signed, they would take their own blood pressures and weight, and with a medical assistant standing by, and then blue, uh, blood glucoses would be checked, and while the health coach continued interactive discussion, I would do brief exams, heart, lungs, and feet, while the patients were seated in the community room where the session took place. As the session wrapped up, I could also do medication refills. But what made this appointment different was that we asked patients to buddy with one another, to provide support between appointments. So in essence, this was a model akin to a 12-step meeting where members shared experiences and support. Years ago, I was intrigued by this model because I saw the confusion and the resignation on the faces of patients with chronic disease who left the traditional 15 to 20 minute visit. I also saw the frustration on the faces of their clinicians, even clinicians early in their training. The common thread was that both patient and clinician felt hopeless. Yet we didn't start out that way. I saw a desire to partner and connect with patients to help improve health care in the residency application essays I read as a faculty attending in family medicine at UCLA. It's this idealism and passion to innovate that we must preserve and nurture. You see, I've always believed that being a physician is a calling. It's a vocation. And yet, instead of feeling like innovators, many of us feel caught up in a system that, that drives burnout. The non-traditional doctor's visit, it's an opportunity to heal the hopelessness and the isolation that many patients with chronic disease of diabetes feel, especially 
vulnerable populations impacted by social isolation, economic challenges, and poor health literacy. My narrative tells the story of one such patient I called Mariana. She's a woman in her late 50s who worked as a janitor and her buddy in the group I called Susie. Mariana lived alone in a rural hamlet. She had no phone. She couldn't read. We had tried unsuccessfully to help Mariana reduce her blood glucose, and despite being assigned a culturally sensitive health coach, we were unable to budge that reading. Mariana's glucose was on average well above 300, and she already had retinal complications from her disease. The fact is, she was demoralized. And truthfully, the whole clinical team was too. Mariana frequently missed appointments, and she was inaccessible via phone. All right, we did do some medication interventions with Mariana. We added an insulin pen. However, we discovered during her participation in the group that she wasn't using it correctly, and so we, we helped with that. But what the secret was to better health outcomes for Mariana was indeed the social connections she made in the group, especially that with her buddy Susie. After the shared medical block participation, her blood glucose on average was reduced significantly from 300s to the low 200s. Not exactly a goal, but it was, it was moving in the right direction. And through that connection to Susie, Mariana, who had been demoralized prior to Juntos Bodemos, was energized and smiling. In fact, they even wanted to, to do a testimonial. And, and Susie, in that testimonial, also mentioned that she felt better physically and that helping Mariana had motivated her. But you know, that wasn't the whole story. On the clinician side of the equation, my team and me felt a sense of agency as we innovated and implemented Juntos Podemos. When I saw the smiles on the faces of the nurse practitioner, the health coach, and the medical assistant as Mariana and Susie shared their success, I knew that Juntos Podemos was helping we providers of care to feel connection to our patients and each other. When I picked up my New England Journal of Medicine in March of 2017, I was struck by two articles in the perspective section. They discussed suicide and depression in medical students and clinicians. Ironically, these searing pieces were immediately followed, immediately followed by another article, The Case for Shared Medical Appointments by Kamalini Ramdas and Ara Darzi, who discussed four crucial components that need to be studied to make this innovative model of healthcare delivery a standard of care. What's needed, they said, are rigorous scientific evidence supporting the value of shared medical appointments, easy ways to pilot and to refine these shared appointment models before applying them in particular care settings, regulatory changes or incentives to support the use of such models, and patient and clinician education. As I summarized in the last lines of my article, by fostering interpersonal connections and relationships, Juntos Podemos resulted in more effective disease management and better health outcomes for Mariana. It also restored to us, her clinical team, a sense of agency and autonomy so essential for preventing or reversing burnout. In the past, my patient's hopelessness mirrored my own. Now, their hope reflects mine. Thank you. I want to leave maximum time for you all, uh, given the, the breadth of topics covered in this. But I, Rebecca, I have to ask one question. Um, I actually have a lot of questions, but but your your, your uh, fidelity to aim instead of method, I think, was really f a fascinating uh, a realization. What I'm my question is this: You spent 12 years testing model, then you shift model. But you don't have 12 years to test the new model, as in training institutions to do this as opposed to doing it yourself. So how do you make the pivot not just to a different model, but also dramatically shortening or maybe even foregoing the, what, what you had just said was a really important testing phase? Yeah, I, mean, I guess I would sort of um, shift the question because I think if we had been going from model A to model B, we might have encountered the challenge that you mentioned. But I think the shift was actually from a model to an approach. And that was the distinction. So the, the notion was that, you know, in we thought we were standardizing and, a, and a sort of obsessively trying to improve the model to replicate it. 
But it turned out what we were really doing was those activities in order to understand the constituent elements of the model so that we could then liberate it. And so it still required that like struggle, the discipline, the iteration, the testing, the data, but you know, the outcome at the end wasn't something then we would then, you know, sort of ship off the conveyor belt to replicate, but actually to then put those, uh, those tools into the hands of folks who candidly like knew the context so much better than we did. So you know, our original model, I think as, as folks probably know, uh, was premised on using college student advocates as that frontline workforce, in part because in the mid-90s when we started, there weren't you know, promotoras and community health workers and care managers and case managers. But you know, by the time that the healthcare sector was really starting to heat up around driving towards health, those workforces were in place, and if we had continued to insist on a college student workforce, we would have lost all the value. And instead, we were able to liberate that value by putting it into the hands of you know, other folks who just could much more deeply understand the workforces, the patient populations, the local resource landscapes, and the, you know, the, the parameters of clinical context. That meant we could, you know, we could walk away from the model you know, very quickly. That's very helpful, thank you. Um, I could ask more, but uh, let's go to Mike in the back, very back, and then we'll go to the gentleman in front of him. Thanks, Alan. Mike Miller, I'm a physician and health policy consultant. I wanna pick up on what Rebecca just was talking about, because I've worked with a lot of very large organizations um, trying to innovate and then diffuse that innovation, except in their parlance, it's usually, um, spread best practices. Um, it's a very different kind of concept, and it's the difference between, between maybe health services research and management consulting. <laughs> but the last thing you said, and I wonder if the other people could expand upon it, about sort of abandoning the model and going to an approach, because I've worked with people who say, well, we're gonna do it here, and then replicate it in all these other places. And I have to try and convince them that you can't really replicate things because there's different culture, there's different resources. It's like taking the model for a bayou house in Louisiana and trying to build it in the mountains of Colorado. It just doesn't work. So if you could talk about sort of that spreading of best practices outside of just the model concept. Thank you. Brian, I mean, the paper talks about the role of the leadership uh, center. So maybe how does it, how did that process uh, um, reflect or, or handle the notion of variability across the hospitals? Uh, I, I think the key point is that each hospital is different. Even within the VA, and we trained all 150 or so VA sites. Um, you've seen one VA, you've seen one VA center. The, the key was to take the essential practices and principles of palliative care and through the leadership centers, um, teach the trainee team how to um, adapt and adopt those. So not focusing so much on thou shalt, but on um, what do you want to achieve? How can palliative care principles and practices help you to do that? How does that fit into your uh, local health system? And how can you use local data to supplement published research to make that case and to really customize it? I'll just say, uh, quick, this is a great question. So I think one of the things that health leads did wrong in the beginning was that we would partner with health systems and you know the idea would be, okay, we're gonna pilot the model and then if it works, it'll then get replicated within the system. But you know, you get just lost in the desert of like, did it work? You know, did it work relative to what? Over what period of time? With which patient population? And in the sort of second half of the work, we started to realize we have to actually start with a commitment to the aim. Is this health system committed to recognizing up to 70% of what actually drives health outcomes, social and environmental factors? We can pilot to learn how to scale within the institution, but that's different from piloting to then evaluate, are we actually actually committed to the aim. And so, you know, it was that shift. Once institutions could commit to the aim, all of the all of the, the piloting and the diffusion was to drive learning towards the achievement of that aim, rather than to decide whether we were committed to it in the first place. Gentleman here. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. My question's for Dr. Oni. Um, Rebecca you obviously have been committed to addressing the social determinants of needs for patients for a long, long time. And now it's just become pretty popular in the healthcare policy arena. What needs to be done to fully implement at the primary care level the social determinants of, 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 of healthcare to improve access, quality, and outcome? I think 
because if we're talking about containing costs at the federal and state level, we've got to get the patients into the healthcare system early before they get into the more acute care system. So how do you put the, this issue on, on steroids and really kick it into motion? Well, first I'd like to say that Bob likes to haze me by calling me Dr. Oni, which I am not. <laughs> um, you know, I think, um, you know, so speaking to the work that, that we've done in North Carolina is a great example. Um, under the leadership of um, Secretary Mandy Cohen there, who's the Secretary of Health and Human Services, this is a great example of leadership committing at the outset, um, as she did about a year ago when she began as Secretary, to the integration of healthcare and social services. And, you know, I think what's so powerful Powerful about that is, you know, her her um, the question she called was, how do we look at every policy choice we make, every operational choice we make in the state of North Carolina through a recognition of a, of the broader set of drivers that impact health? And you know, I think what then happens is this doesn't get reduced to just you know mechanics in the clinic, but every element, whether you know, it's the risk models, the screening protocols, the data that's collected statewide, the workforces that are funded, all of those things actually begin to be leveraged in order to drive towards this broader notion of health. And, you know, the result of that is that, yes, clinical practices are asked to to implement this work kind of at the front lines of patient care, but they do so in a, in a policy context and in an operating context that actually enables them to do so. And, and I think we get lost if we think that we're gonna you know, transform the way care is delivered within the four walls of the practice without recognizing that the, if, the aim, if the aim is not established around a broader notion of health, it's, it's extraordinarily unlikely that practice by practice we're gonna be able to fundamentally change the way that care is delivered. Thanks. As a payer, I just want to add one additional comment, which is I think value-based payment models can certainly help to drive the changes that you talked about. We don't, the reason, you know, you, met, you mentioned that people now talk about social determinants of care much more than they did five or ten years ago. And it's not because we know lots more about social determinants of care. It's because now people are starting to get paid on outcomes in terms of how their patients do over a period of time, and the social determinants are important. So I think continuing to build on the value-based payment models that we have, and even thinking about additional tweaks to those, so that, for example, there's no reason, I, you know, we've done some work where we pay certain payers, I mean, certain providers, if the patients that they're treating's employment rate improves or if their uh, housing status improves. So I, I think there are many ways to really build incentives for providers to address those issues, to continue to make this further. We'll, we'll do the exception uh, at the break. So uh, let's do one last uh, question right here. Hi, I'm Joanne Lynn from Altarum's uh, program on improving elder care. Uh, the new NPRM for Medicare Advantage uh, presages the Chronic Act by allowing uh, or proposing to allow Medicare Advantage plans to begin to pay for uh, health-related non-medical services um, for all persons similarly situated, which is not defined. How do you think that that may uh, uh, change the game uh, to move the uh, health the health-related non-medical services into the 85% for Medicare Advantage plans. Are people going to be eager to take that up or, and really help diffusion of some of these ideas? Or are they going to sit back and sit on their hands and hope somebody else starts paying for Meals on Wheels? That may be an imponderable at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, the devil's I, I tell you what, I tell you what, yeah. let me, um, instead of talking about NPRN, uh, uh, Let's, uh, let, let me just broaden the question out to the payment role, which, James, you mentioned in terms of value-based payment. But um, payment, you know, your slip of the tongue about lucrative. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and both of you, I, I know in your paper, it not, didn't come quite as much in the presentation, but the role of philanthropy and supporting the models. Uh, let, why don't we take this last question and use an opportunity to sort of talk about uh, supportive payment, the problems of payment, just get that in the mix because that is often the tool we, uh, we turn to and it has its uh, pros and cons. So who wants to take on that topic? I, I can say briefly that the, um, 
growing advance of alternative payment models, including Medicare Advantage plans and ACOs and other things, is leading to a second transformation in the palliative care field from hospital-based palliative care to community-based palliative care, where the teams are working with those entities that are at some risk for not only outcomes, but for cost. And I, I think that that is perfect for this stage of evolution in the field, where now we do have a pretty good workforce in the United States that is especially trained in palliative care, and now ready to move upstream and prevent some of the problems we're seeing in hospitals um, where they should, the patients should not necessarily have had to go to get relief and um, good care. Yeah. I think that's uh, certainly a good point. The other piece that I think we probably should think about with regard to payment is that, uh, you know, we're talking about social determinants of care and there are other funding streams in addition to health maybe not enough, undoubtedly not enough, but there are other funding streams through human services that address things like housing, food, and so on. So I think there are many opportunities for us to look for uh, partnerships and opportunities to braid funding to meet needs of individuals who have significant health problems and also lots of psychosocial stresses. Maureen, can you reflect on the role of payment in the transformation that you described? Uh, with a uh, an N of two, maybe that's, that's uh, fine. I did uh, did roll out the shared medical appointments in inner city Los Angeles and in rural California, and um, there was very little cost um, except the Costco veggie tray that I would pick up, um, and then the the the. Um, the one hour a month, and it, talking, speaking to Rebecca's idea that you have to let go of the, of the model, I was able to get an hour a month in the Los Angeles County Clinic I worked at to do a shared medical appointment. That was fine. Um, I didn't have any nursing support, but I had medical students, so we worked that out. Um, and then in the, in the rural setting, I was able to do it on a weekly basis. So I think it's a, a question of having a physician champion or a medical champion um, and um, being flexible. And and sticking to the, I, sticking to a clear aim, what are we looking for here? And uh, I, I I listened to a quote uh, a, a talk by Vivek Murthy um, at the uh, who gave a wonderful podcast at, uh, to the Commonwealth Fund in which he talked about external factors and internal factors of health. The external being all these social determinants of housing, food, and what I was speaking to is the the internal. Uh, social connections that help foster health and that you may still be living in a violent environment, but if you have the, a friend and a resilience, it, it helps. So in terms of uh, payment, um, there's a, the intangible payment of a champion's desire. And I think if we can cultivate that in our medical students and residents, uh, I think that'll go a long way. And, and with the inspiration of my colleagues here on the panel and the work they're doing to lead the way uh, to further these models. Thank you. I'll, I'll just t quickly touch on this point around philanthropy because I think it gets lost in the shuffle. Um, I, you know, I can assure you that there was no alternative payment model um, or health plan that was willing to be with us for 12 years as we really figured out how do you integrate social needs into care delivery. And I think we um, kind of radically underestimate what's required for innovation and the diffusion of innovation if we don't talk about the role of philanthropy. And you know, we were really lucky to be able to bring together a set of funders who, who were in fact willing to commit to an aim and tolerate all the iterative loops that were required, the shifting metrics, in recognition that at the back end, we could actually begin to bridge towards these, um, these new payment models. Um, but those new payment models didn't exist in the mid-90s when we began, and so part of this is, you know, how do we view you know, philanthropy is essentially the equivalent of venture capital that allows us to experiment and hone and learn so that we are ready when the payment models begin to line up. Uh, terrific uh, discussion, terrific examples to learn from. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. We're going to bring up our next panel who will talk some about uh, <clears throat> adoption and Okay, we're gonna move directly to three pa <laughs> papers that look at the effects of 
various uh, innovations. Uh, Ishani Ganguly is a, a practicing primary care physician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. Jay Orlander, Associate Chief for Clinical and Educational Affairs Medical Services and Acting Chief Section of General and Internal Medicine at the VA Boston and Vice Chair for VA Affairs at the Boston University School of Medicine. Uh, Joseph Tannenbaum, uh, MD, PhD candidate in the Department of Population and Quantitative Health Sciences at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. I'll turn it over first to Ashani. Thanks so much for having me. I also want to thank my collaborators, Ativ Marhotra, Jeff Souza, and Michael McWilliams on this work. So, we were interested in thinking about the annual checkup. This is the most common reason that patients go to see their primary care doctor, um, despite ongoing debate about the value of these visits. So in some ways, this is a, you know, as old as time. On the other hand, Medicare just came out with a new version of this. So in 2011, through the Affordable Care Act, Medicare introduced its first version of an annual checkup that was free for beneficiaries. And this was called the annual wellness visit, and it was designed to address health risks in aging adults in particular through a number of different um, elements. So you can see here things like um, screening for home safety, depression, uh, doing a review of cancer screening, talking about end of life care. Um, so what we found is that in previous work that these uh, visit rates have, have been pretty modest, but rising steadily. So you see in 2011, we found about 8% of eligible beneficiaries across the country were using annual wellness visits, and that number rose to just about 19% in 2015. Now the question is, why has it been uptake been slow? And we have heard over this morning about a number of reasons why that could be. Um, one possibility is that you know, this visit has a lot of complex requirements, as we've seen here, um, and certain practices may be better equipped to, uh, to address those requirements than others. For example, practices that can invest in workflows, in physician extenders to, to make these visits happen. At the same time, practices may be motivated to offer these visits for a number of reasons. So these visits are uh, reimbursed at a higher rate than a typical problem-based visit, so there's a revenue angle. And then if you think specifically about uh, some of the alternative payment models we discussed, so specifically accountable care organizations, there, and, and which are incentivized to keep costs within a certain budget for a population of patients, uh, these, these visits may represent a way to sort of keep patients in the practice, um, spe specifically uh, in improving stability of assignment for these patients so that they, the practices can get credit for the, the care that they're offering and the, and the work they're, they're doing to improve the health of these patients. And you could also imagine that these visits may attract younger, healthier patients. And we have found in previous work that the patients who are getting these, um, for better or worse, tend to be a bit younger and healthier. That's true in the wellness literature in general. Um, and so the question was sort of what's at play here? So we decided to try to understand what enabled and motivated practices to adopt these visits. The first thing we found was that there was incredible variation in, uh, in practices adopting them. So about half of practices provided zero visits in 2015 to their eligible beneficiaries. Another quarter of practices provided them to at least 25% of their eligible patients. And we called the, the, the former group the non-adopters and the latter group adopters. Then we wondered, what are uh, predictors of adopting these visits or, or visit use? Um, and what we found first was that uh, practices caring for historically underserved populations, rural populations, uh, um, racial and ethnic minorities, uh, duly enrolled patients with, with Medicaid, and medically complex patients um, were less likely to offer the visit. And what was very interesting about this was, was there was twofold. So firstly, practices that cared for a disproportionate um, portion of these patients were less likely to offer the visit to anybody who walked in their door, no matter that person's status. At the same time, patients who uh, fit the bill fit this bill, so patients on Medicaid, for example, were less likely to get this visit no matter what practice they walked into. So both of these things were at play. Next, we looked at factors that, um, we found a number of factors that predicted greater use of AWVs. So 
uh, practices that had a st stronger primary care focus. In other words, they had a, a larger proportion of primary care physicians were more likely to offer these. Practices where there was a greater proportion of Medicare beneficiaries per, per doctor. So in other words, these individual docs were seeing a lot more patients um, who would be eligible, had much higher rates. And then practices that were part of ACOs and practices that were involved in meaningful use and so therefore had um, capability of using electronic health records um, were much more likely to use these. Interestingly, we found no uh, association with the size of a practice, so size didn't really matter. Next, we looked at some potential motivators for adopting these visits. Uh, and first I'll note that um, when we looked at visit trends, you can see here that these Lighter here. You can see here that um, the, the, the lighter bars on the left re represent the practices that adopted AWVs, and you can see these the blue showing the, the, those visits themselves. The darker purple on the right represent the practices that did not adopt AWVs. And you can see that essentially um, these visits did not add to the existing visits, and it, essentially it seemed to replace other problem-based visits that practices were having, and that could be because pay, uh, doctors were addressing these kinds of issues but just not calling them any wellness visits are a number of reasons. Yet, despite that, um, practices that were that adopted annual wellness visits seem to have greater revenue. And this is not to say that the these visits themselves caused this. In fact, we see a rise among adopters even before the visits were adopted. But it does show, suggest that that is part of the reason and suggest some important differences to think about in, in terms of pay, the practices that are adopting primary care innovation versus not and these, these changes in revenue. Finally, we looked at some of the potential motivators, and here we found that practices that um, we, we use a difference in differences approach to essentially isolate the, the effect of the annual wellness visit adoption. And we found that practices that had adopted the annual wellness visit had on average slightly healthier population, although no, there was no difference in, in the age of the population. And in addition, these practices had greater stability of patient assignment. In other words, patients were more likely to stick with the practice um, for that period of time. So in sum, we found wide variation in use of these visits across the country. There were lower annual wellness visit rates in practices that were serving the, the historically underserved, but higher rates in practices that were involved in innovative models like ACOs and who were using EHRs. We found that um, there were some potential benefits of using these visits, that um, so revenue potentially, but also um, seeing slightly healthier patient population and um, greater stickiness of these patients essentially in the practice. And this brings up the question of how, to the extent that these visits are useful, and that's still a question that we were looking into, um, you know, how can we distribute those benefits more equitably to practices and therefore to patients? Um, and so one, one way to think about that is, is adapting these visits to the practices and the individuals that would uh, most benefit from them. So that's my time. Thank you. I want to thank my uh, wonderful team of collaborators and um, thank Health Affairs for this great opportunity to share our diffusion story um, that we observed and tried to understand. Primary care providers like myself uh, often refer patients to specialists for help in patient care. Electronic consultation or e-consults are a mechanism for provider to provider communication, uh, typically within a shared electronic health record or web-based portal. When used for primary care providers to communicate with specialists, they've been shown to improve timeliness of care, uh, decrease patient travel, enhance efficiency of specialty clinic use, and thereby uh, improve access at reduced cost. The VA is an ideal place to introduce this approach. Our unified electronic health record and salaried staff uh, avoid issues of reimbursement for clinical effort. In 2011, National VA leadership promoted the use of technology to improve specialty access to veterans. Due to sluggish uptake, but a belief in their utility, regional leadership in New England uh, directed all eight of its VA medical centers to offer e-consults uh, across all specialties. That was back in 2013. Once the e-consult option is in our electronic record, there are no restrictions on which clinicians can use it. So we studied use across specialties in order to identify novel and creative practices. We saw a large increase in use 
over the, this time period, but we're surprised to see that across all of New England, now anesthesiologists were now completing more e-consults than any other clinical service. That surprised us because anesthesiology is not a specialty that we primary care providers usually consult. As you can see in this slide, prior to 2013, there was minimal use of e-consults across anesthesia departments. But by 2015, the four sites shown on this slide, who performed the majority of surgeries in New England, were now completing 97% of all these anesthesia e-consults. But use clearly varied by site. We read a sampling of the e-consults to find that these were mostly surgical staff uh, requesting pre-op assessments, a specialty to specialty e-consult. This also seemed to reflect the change in practice as commonly, anesthesiologists saw patients in the days to weeks prior to a planned procedure. We looked at factors such as size of the staff or number and complexity of cases to explain our finding, but we couldn't identify a clear association. We then interviewed staff from anesthesia departments and surg surgical staff um, from each site from where, and asked them about their preoperative processes and where e-consults came in. What we learned is the belief of the leaders of the anesthesia sections drove adoption. Providence had a champion. Uh, their head of anesthesia believed that nearly all the information he needed to provide a risk assessment and plan anesthesia care was present in the electronic record. If they found a clinical concern using e-consults, which now occurred within a day or two of the surgeons planning a procedure, it was time to sort things out. Providence moved to nearly 100% of their pre-op assessments by e-consult, uh, including patients undergoing more complex procedures such as joint replacement and intrathoracic surgery. And they eliminated their standing pre-op clinic. They will see patients in person if the patients or the surgeons request it, and sometimes call patients by phone to sort out a symptom or a concern. They now report that e-consults dramatically improved his staff workflow, improved patient care and satisfaction, and expedited OR scheduling. Togus main providers heard about the approach from the Togus chief. Our main colleagues, as you can see here, serve a very rural population, and they saw this approach as veteran-centric innovation, reducing the travel burden for patients that had to go many hours often just to attend the pre-op clinic. They chose to adopt e-consults for low-risk procedures, such as cataract and hernia repair. Togus does a lot of e-consults, but that reflect, reflecting the lower complexity of their surgical workload. They now staff a pre-op clinic with an anesthesiologist just two days a week down from five and report improved scheduling and decreased wait times. Boston, Massachusetts, where I work, mostly mimics the main docs in their enthusiasm for e-consults. As the principal tertiary care referral site for five New England states, all except Connecticut, Boston has the highest surgical volume and complexity of cases. So with concurrence of their surgical colleagues, they make an exception and complete e-consults to accommodate some patients undergoing more complex surgeries who have long travel distances and whom the surgeons have deemed clinically appropriate. They still staff a pre-op clinic five days a week, but report having more time for the patients in the clinic. Reasons cited for limiting e-consult use include the impersonal nature of the e-consult and perceived benefits of pre-op education on post-operative care. West Haven, Connecticut was our least enthusiastic group. They believed that overall workload was not different, but just shifted within the department when e-consults were requested. And they expressed concern about potential inadequate pre-operative education of patients. Due to the perceived pressure to use e-consults, they set a target of 20% of all their elective surgeries would be done this way, but they established the most restrictive criteria of all sites. They still staff their clinic five days a week, uh, but do admit to fewer patient complaints and scheduling's a bit easier. So our e-consults in the VA clearly have a lot of the ca characteristics we heard about on diffusion of technology but we attribute the diffusion of e-consult use in the pre-op process within VA New England to administrative leadership, easily adoptable technology, the opinion of a local champion, and the perception of e-consults on the impact of workflow, patient convenience, and quality of care. Thank you.
Uh, my name is Joseph Tannenbaum. I'm an MD-PhD candidate at Case Western uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, I uh, want to echo my colleagues on the panel uh, and thank Health Affairs for putting on this event uh, and the opportunity to learn from so many uh, folks from, from across the country that are doing really innovative work. Uh, my talk today is about the association of a regional health improvement collaborative, or RIC, uh, with rates of ambulatory care sensitive hospitalizations. So a bit of background uh, on the importance of uh, the concept of ambulatory care sensitive hospitalizations, particularly uh, in a value-based payment environment. Uh, conditions for which access to better primary care and more timely primary care uh, may actually prevent hospitalizations uh, are termed uh, by ARC, in fact, as ambulatory care sensitive conditions, or ACSCs. And it's estimated that about $30 billion is spent annually on uh, ACSC-related hospitalizations, or ACSHs. Uh, and as a result, ACSHs are a widely accepted and utilized metric uh, of primary care quality. Uh, and in fact, measuring ACSH rates uh, drove uh, some, some of the innovative models that we've heard about today, uh, in particular accountable care organizations, or ACOs, uh, comprehensive primary care, now comprehensive primary care plus, uh, et cetera, uh, and particularly in the context of opportunities for uh, shared savings. And while ACOs and CPC and now CPC Plus emerged uh, over the last uh, decade uh, as potentially transformative models of both healthcare delivery and healthcare payment, uh, simultaneously the, the notion and the idea of regional health improvement collaboratives uh, sort of co-evolved uh, over a similar time frame. And so today I'm going to be talking about one such regional health improvement collaborative uh, that's uh, called the Better Health Partnership, uh, which, is a, which is a RIC that operates uh, in Cuyahoga County. And for those of you not familiar with your Ohio geography, uh, Cuyahoga County is, is Cleveland and the surrounding suburbs. Um, and so while a lot has been, a lot of work has been uh, done looking at ACOs, CPC, uh, et cetera, uh, and the potential impacts on ACSH rates, very little has been done about uh, the effect that RICs might have uh, in, on, on similar outcomes. And so Better Health is a, is a primary care driven uh, model of regional health improvement collaborative, and about 70% of all primary care that's delivered in Cuyahoga County uh, is affiliated with Better Health at some level. And I should mention that Better Health includes providers uh, across the healthcare uh, spectrum from large academic uh, medical centers, including Metro Health and the Cleveland Clinic, uh, to safety net providers, federally qualified health centers, uh, free clinics, uh, and, and the Cleveland VA. So really a wide spectrum, as well as stakeholders and partners uh, from, ins from insurance uh, to patient advocacy groups. And so Better Health, when it was founded, uh, decided to focus on uh, three major uh, conditions that affect population health, diabetes, heart failure, and hypertension. Uh, all of which contribute to ARC-defined uh, ambulatory care-sensitive hospitalizations. And so the secret sauce of Better Health, what Better Health tries to do, and these are terms you've heard a lot about today in earlier sessions, uh, is to identify best practices using the positive deviance approach uh, from the different members uh, of the collaborative, figure out who is delivering the highest quality care, and then having yearly learning collaboratives, uh, twice yearly learning collaboratives, excuse me, to disseminate the ideas uh, and best practices that have been uh, sort of unearthed at, at the various clinical sites, uh, and perhaps even more importantly, also uh, using practice coaches who are sort of on the ground helping to redesign workflows and figure out how to deliver uh, more effective uh, care and, and achieve better population health outcomes. And so our question was, was the implementation of Better Health associated with a significant change in the rate of ambulatory care sensitive uh, hospitalizations, and were there any potential cost savings uh, that might have been achieved by the broader healthcare system? And so we used a difference in differences design where we, uh, the first difference asks, was there any difference in the preventable hospitalization rate for Cuyahoga, between Cuyahoga County and our comparator counties? And those were the next five largest urban counties in Ohio, which uh, correspond to the cities of Toledo, uh, Dayton, Akron, Cincinnati, and Columbus. And then the second difference asked, if there was a difference between the hospitalization rates for these conditions, uh, how did that evolve over time? And so here, what you can see, uh, this is the pre-Better Health era beginning in 2003, and you can see that uh, hospitalization rates for these conditions was higher in Cuyahoga County relative to our comparator counties. Uh, but for, and there are a number of reasons for that I'd be happy to get into later that we, that we suspect is the driver of that. Um, but from an analytic perspective, what you can see is that the rates evolved over time. So the good news is hospitalization rates were generally going down before the implementation of better health, both in Cuyahoga and in our comparator counties. Um, however, those trends uh, evolved similarly. Um, after better health was implemented, uh, what we see here is that uh, the 
gap narrows considerably between Cuyahoga County and our comparator counties. And up at the top, you can see uh, sort of an estimated uh, trend line based on uh, if you use just the data from the pre-Better Health era, what we would have projected uh, hospitalizations to be. Uh, and in our comparator counties, uh, they're much closer to expectation uh, than we were uh, in Cuyahoga County. And a small point, we actually estimated two different uh, post periods because of uh, some, some differences uh, in healthcare systems that, that evolved uh, in, in about 2011 and onward. So to put some numbers to that picture that I just showed you, we actually estimated that about 5,700 hospitalizations for these conditions were averted um, uh, after the implementation of Better Health in Cuyahoga County. And if we look at the cost per hospitalization for each of these different types of conditions, we estimate that about $40 million was saved to the broader healthcare system uh, uh, by averting these hospitalizations. And as sort of a, a, a small but very significant point here, the annual budget of Better Health is about $1.5 million um, relative to to the $40 million in potential savings to the broader healthcare system. And so our conclusions uh, are that better health was uh, associated with a significant reduction in the uh, rate of preventable hospitalizations and uh, some cost savings were possibly achieved. And taking sort of a step back to sort of tie it together with some of the themes that we heard uh, earlier today, uh, primary care focused and in specific provider led uh, regional improvement collaboratives may be able to avert preventable hospitalizations uh, for ambulatory care sensitive conditions. And as a result, we, we believe that our results are actually a real cause for optimism that increased adoption of these collaborative based models that aim to bring together competitors uh, to improve the, the health of populations uh, can really make a big difference, particularly in the area of preventable hospitalizations and associated costs. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask a quick question of each of you and maybe a moment for the audience. But, um, Ashani, I can't help as I listen to your presentation to uh, put it in the context of other sort of pay for performance initiatives, uh, particularly the literature growing that, for example, uh, those that uh, serve hospitals, safety net hospitals being disproportionately penalized by some of the value-based payment and, and uh, readmissions penalties. And the sense of sort of the rich get richer because they have the infrastructure and they know that there's a new code here and they adopt and those who don't, uh, don't and fall behind. I, I don't want to overstate that story, so I just wonder if, if that's my story, is that your story? Do you have a sense? Um, of, of whether we're sort of trapped in this place where innovation is going to diffuse in a way that the leaders actually get further ahead and the laggards fall further behind? That's a great question. I think, you know, in some sense you can think about these innovations in primary care payment as a, a broader effort to try to funnel more money into the investment in primary care, right? And compared to other countries, we underinvest in that foundation of healthcare. And so to the extent that AWV's annual wellness visit payments are an investment in primary care writ large, um, this is suggesting that that investment is going to practices that are already um, able to uh, to reap the, the benefits of, of these payments. Um, and so I think it does speak to that narrative, uh, absolutely. And then the second question that comes up is thinking about these visits in particular, are there ways, um, you know, I, as a primary care doctor, I've um, performed these visits on a number of patients and um, I've seen firsthand that this, that um, especially for patients with really complex social um, uh, lives or complex um, um, issues at home, financial issues, et cetera, this can feel like a distraction. And so are there, uh, yet we still really need to think about preventive care in these populations. And so um, the question arises, are there better ways of formulating this visit, making it less prescriptive, um, or you know, using alternative mechanisms to ensure that, prim that preventive care is, is met um, for, for these populations so that we can still meet the goals of the annual wellness visit and um, alternative payment mechanisms to make sure that um, these practices are getting the support they need. Uh, Jay, uh, given the earlier presentations of the literature, it's not surprising that diffusion would be in part dependent on a champion. But it is interesting, and it's what what I was struck by is that the different champions had different reasons for championing. So it's not ch champion, not champion is not a one zero thing. I guess my question is, um, what do we know, and, and the lack of champions. So the, what what do we know about the creation of those champions? Was this just sort of random that you drop this innovation into some different settings, and it just happens to be that person A views it this way, person B views it that way, or in the rollout, is there anything that would guide people toward a certain narrative or away from another narrative? 
Well, in the absence of hard data, obviously the, um, the Providence site um, had a very low, small staff, only um, a little more than two full-time equivalent anesthesiologists and a core group of nurse anesthetists. Um, so the challenges that that group had in covering the pre-op clinic and covering all scheduled surgeries was greater than some of the very large staffs in Boston or Connecticut. Um, so there was an inducement perhaps to want to believe that this uh, improved patient care and scheduling um, and had no downside costs. Um, and yet there's also a group of academics I know within the facility at which I work who want to wholeheartedly believe in one published paper um, that's a decade old prior to the true, the current establishment of pre-op assessment where they believe that all their pre-op uh, um, education has great post-op benefits and decreases length of stay, um, but I would say that pre-op education can be given by the surgeons, from the nurse practitioners, from the inpatient nurses, and it's not clear that the anesthesiologist needs to be the one delivering it. Um, so I think it's an example of where in the absence of data, um, folks will um, try to believe in the improvements that they perceive, um, and I think there's no right answer here as of yet, and so there are opportunities to study it further. Joseph, this may be imponderable, but I am curious. It's nice to see a positive outcome, a positive health outcome. It's nice to see a positive return on investment. Sure. I wonder the degree to which that's actually uh, the primary motivator for, or a partial motivator for uh, participants in the initiative. Um, what if you came back with a paper that said, no, uh, no ROI here, would that deter them, or is it that they feel like they're doing the right thing? I'm just, anything in that sure. sense would yeah, be helpful. No, it's that, that, that's a great question, and uh, having attended a number of these learning collaboratives uh, and, and visiting several of these clinics myself in the course of this work and others, I can tell you that the enthusiasm is widespread. Um, the enthusiasm around I, the idea that coming together uh, strengthens everybody uh, involved uh, is something that uh, I think is a constant theme throughout uh, the Cleveland uh, healthcare uh, area. Um, and I, I agree with you that it's nice that we got a, a positive result, uh, certainly uh, for the purposes of a presentation. Um, but I know that, I, I think I want to sort of take the answer in a little bit different direction, which is to say that there have been a number of studies um, increasingly since we started this work about different collaboratives that have found mixed results. Um, and I think that to something to highlight is that the, the, the RIC model is not a one-size-fits-all. Um, you need to take into account the uh, capacity of the region in which you're working to actually affect the changes that you're, that you're trying to drive. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, to really highlight one point from this, it's that you really need to be uh, aware and cognizant of, of what's possible uh, and move, uh, folks, uh, move folks forward in that direction. I'm encouraged to hear that, and it, I reflect back on Maureen's uh, presentation just in the prior panel. The, the importance of meaning and connection right. and uh, a sense of purpose, and that regardless of the five-year time cycle of an evaluation or even the complexities of, of drawing clear conclusions about the effects, that sense of coming together to do something I think is very powerful, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Uh, we can probably fit a question or two here as well. Um, <clears throat> and get the microphone over. Yes. Those are great presentations. My question is about equity and disparities. So, you know, one of the things is that innovation and quality improvement can really widen disparities for the reason that Ashani brought up, that the uptake is easier for those who have the resources to improve. And I guess, um, Jay, I'm really interested, like, did you, how did you address inequities? Did you measure them? Um, what can we do to build in equity as we innovate so we make sure that we're reaching everybody? Um, I mean, all veterans have a similar access to care with the exception if they um, live further away and based on their uh, service-connected illness. Um, they, um, in this sense, the, I'm not sure where their inequity would be. Um, the Across the board, there are challenges. There are lots of publications that are now uh, describing use of e-consults um, very broadly for some of the same reasons. And I think they're um, across specialties, some specialties, data-driven specialties like hematology, they're very popular. 
Um, they're popular in our facility, and they're popular in other facilities. Um, whereas uh, specialties that require more physical examination and the nuances of the history don't uptake them as much. Um, I think your question would be, in patients who are subject to an e-consult, perhaps with or without their permission, um, are the outcomes similar? So then are we seeing differential use not um, based on what's better for the doctors, not better for the patients? And I don't think we have that information yet. Um, patients do seem like not to travel. Um, in the area of preoperative medicine, they often don't understand why they have to tell their story to yet another clinician who's not doing their surgery. Um, and so the, they seem to have appreciated that, uh, that part of the innovation in using e-consults. Um, and it's, from what I can tell from Improvidence is there are very few patients who ask to actually see the anesthesiologist. Now, having said that, anesthesiologists have to see every patient before surgery. The difference in this process is they see them the day of surgery where they need to you know, look at their throat, examine their neck prior to an intubation, or examine their spine and get informed consent. So anesthesiologists are seeing every patient. They're just not seeing them twice, um, well in advance of the surgery and then right at the time of surgery. So if I, if I could just jump yep. in there on to, to, to address that question, um, I think it's really important to think about disparities and, and inequities, and that's something that Better Health really focused on from day one, was how do we measure disparities in the population that we're serving? Um, and I can tell you anecdotally from looking at Better Health's data, and this is in a forthcoming uh, paper, so watch out, Alan and folks, uh, but uh, that, that in don't, fact- Don't give it all away here. Yeah, right, uh, but, but, but to, to make a very long story short, uh, disparities virtually disappeared. Um, across race, across income groups, across uh, payer type, um, uh, in, in a lot of the outcomes that, that, they were, that, that Better Health focused on uh, for heart, hypertension, heart failure, and diabetes. So um, I think that it's a really important to focus on disparities and inequities, but there's a way to diffuse innovation in a way that, um, that, that brings everybody along. It's a really key point and one that requires a, a, a whole uh, additional discussion. Quick question, quick answers, because I don't want to delay our... Uh, Sean, thank you very much for looking into the um, somewhat ritualized part of healthcare, the annual physical exam. I run the Marine Corps Marathon every year. Since 2005, I call it the physical exam. My question is simple. When functional performance will become actually an integral part of this? We talk so much about exercise and so forth, but we never see that in the annual physical exams as, with as much emphasis as it would deserve. So... Um, in, in the population we're looking at, in the aging population, we do look at the annual wellness visit does include an assessment of functional uh, fitness, essentially. It, it's not in the same uh, population as Marines, so we're not looking at, you know, your, your, I guess, how long it takes you to run a mile, but rather, can you get up and go? Um, you know, the time it takes to get up, um, walk across the room and come back. And that is in, an element that's incorporated and speaks to in, um, the sort of broader goals of the visit to focus on things that would be relevant to an aging population as opposed to listening to the heart, listening to the lungs, which are not required elements. Um, I can't speak to the broader trends towards including physical fitness, though. Great. Uh, please, as I invite my final panelists up, join me in thanking this terrific panel. We're going to close with a slightly more conversational approach. Uh, you've heard a lot of papers, but there are also a tremendous number of themes uh, that, that we've gotten into, and I want to tease some of those out. Um, you'll be hearing from Sharon Ar Arnold, Deputy Director at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and Acting Director of its Center for Delivery Organization and Markets. Uh, Will Schrank, who was our theme advisor uh, for this issue, our great our gratitude to him for all of that's involved in doing that. Chief Medical Officer for UPMC Insurance uh, Services Division, with a faculty appointment in the Department of Internal Medicine. Mike Squires, Vice President for Innovation Public Policy at Blueprint Healthcare IT Care Navigator, Inc. Um, I will note, and I don't draw any conclusions from this, but we did ask CMMI to be here, and they were not available to participate, but they're obviously another part of the innovation ecosystem that has been referenced in the discussions earlier today. So uh, to effectuate a more conversational style, I'm going to sit down. <laughs> See how successful that is in making it more conversational. Um, but um, again, we, we've gone from sort of theory to practice, 
And we've also talked a lot about models, and I'd like to start with just a sense from each of you, in some respects by way of your own introduction to the audience. Where do you fit in the ecosystem of innovation? What is, what is your role in uh, promoting the diffusion of innovation? Sharon, you seem like a natural place to start, so I'll turn okay. to you. Well, thank you very much for <laughs> inviting me here and for um, this really important issue. Um, ARC's mission is to improve the quality and safety of healthcare, and it does it by focusing on three pillars. The first is uh, producing evidence, either through grants to independent researchers or through our own researchers. And this is evidence about um, primarily kind of what works in making healthcare better. So it's really the how to innovate. Um, we also develop uh, tools and training to facilitate the um, a spread of innovation and to make sure that researchers are poised to answer the right questions, the questions that are of most importance to health systems. And then finally, we uh, produce data and measures to track the performance. So I feel like we're all over this and, um, and our goal is to really facilitate the diffusion of innovation to improve the healthcare system. Well. Well, we're all very, very grateful for the role that you play. Uh, so I'm at the UPMC uh, Insurance Services Division. And as we know, the, the true innovation and dissemination happens in the marketplace. So we need an environment that is conducive to testing and to learning and to spreading. Um, at UPMC, I think we have a pretty unique environment to do that. We have uh, a large health plan with 3.3 million members. We have a large health system, 41 hospitals, uh, lots of doctors. Uh, our health plan ensures uh, about 40% of the patients that our, our health plan ensures are seen by UPMC doctors. So there's a sweet spot there where we are aligned between the payer and the provider. And when you see efforts in the marketplace to disseminate, to, to, to test new models, it's the fragmentation that often gets in the way. Who pays, who ultimately, why, what makes a model sustainable? But in an environment where you have a payer and a provider that are uh, you know, sort of responsible for the same bottom line, that are focused on improving the health of the same population, that are deeply committed to reducing the healthcare costs and improving the care of the population that they serve together, a lot of those barriers sort of diffuse away. On top of that, we've built a real infrastructure uh, to support innovation, a, pro a, a process that we call BUILD, the Business Innovation Learning and Dissemination Group. It's a goofy uh, acronym, I know, but um, the goal is to pull together people with methodologic expertise and a deep commitment to rapid cycle learning. And we all know that there's lots and lots of good ideas out there that do or don't get implemented, do or don't get diffused based on how their, how, what the uptake looks like, how the implementation works. It's not whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, it's how it's actually, it's actually about the operations. And the goal of this build process is to get really, really deep into the operations process, to learn fast, to look at data rapidly, to bring both the clinical operations, the policy leaders, the product leaders together to make rapid decisions about what is and isn't working, mid-course corrections, and really drive a rapid learning um, exercise. So I think though all of those pieces, when put together, offers us a unique opportunity to, uh, to test the kind of program that James Schuster described earlier with the seriously mental ill behavioral health homes um, and to try to really um, partner more with external groups around solving the key problems, the key aims that we all share. Hi, Mike Squires. I guess I represent the marketplace here this morning. Um, our company has really become laser focused on the world of care coordination and closing gaps in healthcare delivery. And I've tried to point this at in getting to, uh, ready for today. I tried to think what is all the disparate things that are going on in innovation and the complexity and the diffusion. And I came up with uh, my, my triple aim focus, my triple dimension focus of innovation, um, which are. Um, I have to look at my notes here. Community, 
automation and platform. That to me are the three elements, the three dimensions you need to look at to figure out how to, what innovation should be, where it will work, and how to accelerate that. We got involved in, we had high goals in starting out when, when the High Tech Act passed. What can we do to take away uh, gaps that exist? And we decided to do something unusual, introduce speed dating to health IT. Um, John Halamka called it the, uh, the e-harmony for health IT. But <laughs> we brought together in three regional sessions 10 uh, innovative entrepreneurs and 10 CIOs and three, to meet them up through speed dating and see what could come out of it. And then we had our, an advisory board who was talking and realized that they were less focused on the, innovate, the innovation programs we were running and more interested in comparing notes with each other. And we realized that several of them were from innovation centers, uh, provider-based organizations. And so we decided these people need to talk to each other. They, when they started an innovation center, they would do some benchmarking going and talk around to each other. And then they stayed focused on what they were doing within themselves. So we set up a series of five forums across the country, starting with Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, at Johns Hopkins uh, Innovation Institute on the West Coast, and then Mayo uh, Cl Center, uh, Clinic Center for Innovation. And we did speed dating among provider-based innovation centers. One, getting them together to see what they could learn from each other and doing some brainstorming as well. Um, and we supported a Commonwealth Fund study in terms of providing some uh, reach out to innovation centers to learn what innovation centers are doing. And in this survey, their top result of the focus of innovation centers, which was kind of a surprise to us, this was in 2005, was care coordination. That's our focus. So we were pleased to learn that because we're trying to work in the same area. And that's where we've gone to focus on those areas. And it's really been working with things that have been actually created by ARC and Fundamentals, working with One Care Vermont, which had a learning, which was built on a learning collaborative and took many of those fundam fundamentals and decided they needed to, in their communities, really a community of communities, automate that, uh, that patient care and workflows and put it on a single platform to connect all these disparate uh, groups within health service agencies. So that's the short story. Perhaps too long a short story. It's, it's great. You all are operating in very different environments, and that was the goal for having you here. Um, Mike, you started down this path, but I'm going to turn back to Sharon. Uh, talk about uh, uh, one or two successful models of diffusion. Uh, again, we sort of heard a lot about the theory. We've heard some examples. From your perspective, where do you see success? What are the key elements? So I, I think we're particularly interested now in moving from kind of diffusion, diffusing kind of one innovation at a time individually to thinking about how to set up the infrastructure in the healthcare system so that there's more a pull of diffusion and it seamlessly gets incorporated into um, the healthcare system. And so that's really where we're focused now. So um, I'll talk about a couple of examples where we think we saw hints of this and where we're further studying this area. The first is the partnership for patients. Now many of you might think of this as a CMS innovation because they really funded a lot of this activity, but we were a partner with them and we worked very closely with them to do some of the research behind some of the um, activities that were promoted in partnership for patients. Um, we developed the measurement structure and some of the tools that were used. And so again, um, this kind of infrastructure of tools that were not only focused on single interventions, but could be adapted um, across a, a variety of interventions was really critical, I think, to the success of that initiative. And that initiative was very successful in a four-year, five-year period. Um, the project or the program um, saw a 21% reduction in hospital-acquired conditions, um, resulting in 3 million fewer adverse events in hospitals, 125,000 lives saved, and 28 billion in savings, according to our estimates. So pretty significant. Um, we heard about um, evidence now earlier about kind of creating this infrastructure for small and medium-sized physician practices to improve heart health, but it's not 
necessarily focused on heart health. It's really focused on the infrastructure. We've also got another project looking at health systems, kind of the other end of the spectrum, and trying to identify what makes health systems uh, successful at implementing evidence with good outcomes and, and just try and understand kind of what are the parameters of success there. Great. Well, well, I think I sort of answered yeah. this on the, the first time. Um, uh, just a couple highlights would be that the importance of alignment of the payer and the provider and the effort to try to disseminate uh, and learn, um, uh, rapid use of data, rapid cycle assessment of performance, and uh, to build off Rebecca's comments, the sort of the need to focus on the aim but be able to be flexible around what the model looks like, I think is exactly right. Um, but it does, you know, I've just been reflecting uh, at a higher level about hearing these great, great presentations. Um, and thinking about for us, or for you know, many of us who are in the, in the field, in the marketplace, and trying to innovate and disseminate, what a critical role uh, the government has played, in particular over the last seven years, in really driving our opportunity to lead, and driving our opportunity uh, to test and learn and get better and improve. Uh, I, you know, the ARC's leadership is clear, and I think you've, it's been outlined very, very, um, very, um, in broad strokes, but with, with a lot of with great detail here, I think you're, what you've done in terms of both creating taxonomy, but also really focusing on specific programs and trying to, in particular around patient-centered medical homes, really disseminate what works and what doesn't work. The role of PCORI in testing new models, comparing new models, developing better evidence, really driving uh, the science around how to disseminate and innovate and then, uh, as Rocco described, CMS in the setting of, of the Innovation Center and the opportunity to, to, to rapidly expand and scale on new payment models, uh, every one of those models had a learning and dissemination organization. Every one of those models had at its core a focus on, on improvement and innovation and dissemination. And there is a, a more of a sense of inevitab inevitability now than I think there ever was. I think uh, 10 years ago, folks in the marketplace would think about their innovations as proprietary. It gave them a, some sort of a competitive advantage. And I think now there is a clear expectation you're participating in, in something bigger, and there is an expectation, essentially a requirement, to share. Uh, that's happening. I think it's palpable to me uh, in, the, in the sort of circles that I spend time in. I'm not sure that's true everywhere, but I think a lot of that uh, is due to what the government's done, the government serving as a catalyst to really make this happen. Mike, you, your answer to the first question was in essence the sense that people wanted to talk to each other. Does that, does that collaborative sense stick? I, I, I don't want to get and trip over the question of, of where you've seen success and why, but I do want to bring in this notion of, of whether we've moved from a proprietary to a sharing environment for innovation. That would be a big deal. Well, even in our own case in New Jersey, I would say before the High Tech Act, uh, hospitals weren't really talking to each other about problems per se. Uh, they're more like hiding their problems than sharing their problems. Uh, hospital CIOs would get together in regular meetings and wouldn't talk about what their issues were. So with the beginning of the High Tech Act, people started actually, they had to share and talk to each other about what the, not only what their big successes were, but what their problems were. So that really has changed the whole you know, environment. I mean, our, our business wouldn't exist with what it's doing, without what ARC did, without what CMS did, government became a major uh, cause of not only innovation, but diffusion too. And even what we're doing, we, we had to be, as much as we try to market things, we had to be discovered. People had to find out, oh, who can do these things? So the first thing was with One Care Vermont, they had ma an, an amazing toolkit, which they have published online, of all their assessments, their programs, all the processes, it was wonderful. And I th assumed that every ACO would have those. 
Well, I was surprised that they didn't. And we did a webinar with Pacific Group for uh, Business, with, a, uh, with um, OneCare as well as some other people to describe what toolkits are and how people are using them. But the key is now they, we had to help uh, OneCare move from using their care coordinators, which weren't uh, a single hospital coordinators, but diverse through uh, primary care practices, behavioral health organizations, social service agencies, uh, they had to talk to each other. And they had these processes, but they weren't real, had a way of communicating. So how could they do that? One is, when they did assessments, how could they automate them? They, they were using Excel spreadsheets and Post-it notes, essentially, which is what most care coordinators in the country use in the end. They may have a mechanism in EHR where they look up information, but when it comes to actually doing their work every day, it's the Excel spreadsheet and the Post-it notes. How to automate that, and not only automate it, but potentially automate it into a shared care plan. And so when it came to Massachusetts, which is starting a new ACO program now, and their behavioral health people were charged with organizations uh, care coordinating for all of health, how could they do that? It wasn't something that could come from an EHR. Yes, they needed EHR for information, but how could they connect all those pieces and automate a shared care plan to become, uh, I should say, automate assessments to turn them into shared care plans? And so there are lots of challenges we push down to the lowest level, but need some kind of innovation in order to actually make it work. <coughs> um. Will and Sharon, you both describe environments rich with innovations. Um, going back to Jim's very first slide, most innovations don't diffuse. Where's the decision point um, in deciding which ones are worth the effort? If it's hard to diffuse um, and there's a lot bubbling up out there, someone has to say, this, we're gonna put our bet on this one and we're not gonna put our bet on that one. That seems like a very fundamental decision, and I would love to hear thoughts about how those decisions get made in your two environments. Um, so I'll start. I think, um, number one, I think um, we need to look at innovation as part of a, a broader body of work. Um, I think we don't necessarily want to be in the position of every time there's a new finding going out and pushing to implement that before we understand how that fits in the body of work. So sometimes caution is appropriate. And I, you know, I think that we need to um, make sure that um, we understand when it's appropriate and when it isn't. But I think that um, from my perspective, the innovation is really happening in the private sector. And the federal government and academia can be, um, it, it can be incubators, but um, we need to transition in academia to, ans to asking the right questions and um, developing innovations that have the ability to uh, spread and are appropriate for um, the, the private sector. And I, I think that right now in academia, um, folks are being promoted based upon the number of papers that are submitted to academic journals, no? Uh, <laughs> accepted, accepted by not yeah, Accepted, but, um, but not really um, how they're, you know, how closely they're working with um, systems and how, uh, how creative they are at coming up with innovations that can be um, disseminated. And I think we need a, a mind shift on um, what is valued in terms of the health services research that gets uh, funded. I think it's one of the hardest questions because there are, you know, an infinite number of problems out there that we want to solve. We have, we, if you're a payer, you're, you take care of a lot of vulnerable patients. And we all know that there's, there's just so many different ways. We could leverage our resources to help each and every patient in a way that would make their lives better. Um, we, um, probably err on the side of going after too much rather than too little. We're probably not quite as disciplined as we could be uh, in that there's a deep sense of responsibility, a deep sense of mission, a real belief that what by leveraging more generous benefit designs in specific areas, by addressing social determinants of health, by sending community health workers to the home, by 
uh, leveraging technology to better engage patients, um, that by creating more richer medication-assisted therapy programs for patients with opiate problems, by integrating behavioral and physical health homes, that all of these, pro every one of these programs feels like it could work. And um, it's hard to not go after all of them. If you were to say, how do you, how, you know, how, how do we sort of tease them out? How do we say, well, we're going to do 12 this year and not 18? I think it really comes down to where the mission seems most critical. I don't think, I, I can say quite clearly, this is not a, you know, a dollars and cents decision. This is, a, this is really a question about understanding our members, understanding our population, understanding the levers we have between the payer and the provider. And how can we, with a deep commitment to improving the health of the, of the population we serve, what are the, what's sort of the best ways that we think we could get there? And you know, some of these things are going to lose money, but it's, it's the right thing to do. And Mike, you mentioned a, an alignment around this notion of care coordination. On the one hand, that's a great source of alignment. I, it does strike me, however, that that's a pretty broad term. And so to say, wow, we've got all these centers out here, and they all want to do this, this could be really, really different. That's certainly, <coughs> excuse me, that's certainly true. So e even when you look at uh, any toolkit, there can be a variety of things in there. So which do you approach and how do you approach it? And that's what always confuses me about healthcare, frankly, because there are so many possibilities and so many things to do. Is with what, where do you start? Where do you put your, where do you put your energy? And uh, I think that that's one of the, and people will say, well, is it care management? Is it care coordination? Is it case management? It was, all these terms are somewhat interchangeable. Not really, is specifically, but in the broad sense, yes. So the question then became, what do you need to do specifically? So the more specific it could be, the better we could potentially produce something that could help make that happen for people. So what it's really gotten down to is, if people actually use care coordinators, whatever they are, um, that are trying to make sure that they move people from one place to another, that they have transportation to get there, that they take into account social determinants of health, that they just make sure that they're reminded to get to a medical appointment. Those are very basic blocking and tackling exercises. But to do that, how do you do it in an organized fashion? When we did a survey of uh, care coordinators and care coordinator managers, what was their challenge? Just prioritizing what the day was. I mean, we talked to someone who went through an Excel spreadsheet. Every day their team would go through it. Who do we talk to? What next? So we had to find a way of organizing that process for care coordinators to deal with the specific patients and get those actions that needed to be done by dealing with the most difficult patients. The more it's laid out, I can't necessarily tell you the results. I mean, we'll have some results. Uh, the Commonwealth Fund is doing a case study of One Care Vermont and what we did in that, and so a case study will be coming out in another month or two, and there will be some results that will be shared there. But one of the exciting examples is with Mass Health, they have really laid out what needs to be done for their uh, behavioral health patients who need care that a accountable care organization couldn't provide. And they laid out, these are the actions that need to be taken. And we were able to take that and actually put that in an organized fashion so they know what needs to be done. And they're paid of eight or so qualifying activities that they have to do. Now, will it work? Well, we'll have to see. But at least they have a very organized method for doing it that we could actually help them implement a system. And we have now seven community partners, which are a key part of this, which is about a third of, the, of what's being done in Massachusetts, to get together and make sure they do it. At this point, these are people who are highly competitive in behavioral health organizations, but now they're meeting together to figure out how to do this because they know they need to do it in order to serve their patients. I'm going to ask a final question. I'm going to come down the line this way because the, the federal official has to go last. <laughs> um, will you, you 
somewhat obliquely noted that resources, that it's not about make, you know, it's not about uh, what it costs always because it's about mission, but resource constraints are real everywhere, whether it's dollars or people or, or institutional support. Um, you've each learned a lot about innovation, diffusion. I'd like your thoughts if you were in a setting, if your setting had more resources for diffusion, based on what you know about what makes diffusion successful, where would you put those resources to maximize the likelihood that it would yield a higher rate of diffusion of the innovations that we need? Mike? I would say, really, it's the recognition, aware, uh, recognition awareness, and money by generally state Medicaid agencies, if not CMS, where it's appropriate, not only to assign opportunities and, and goals and programs, but to make sure there's some kind of technology that can really support that, which EHRs, as they're set up today, really can support it. They help, but that's a 90s look at things. It's not necessarily, it's not the 21st century look. Um, and they're as great as they are. They're amazing, vastly superior to where they were before. But it's not enough. It won't, it doesn't automate workflow. It doesn't share information with parents and family members and cab drivers and other people that need to participate in this whole network of care. So you need to look at not only uh, is there technology that can be supportive of that, but all to give, uh, to allow money for that, but also to allow the individual organizations to decide on their own how to best do that. Mass Health didn't, they wanted add EHRs, and then other people said, who are in the organizations, we need some kind of care coordination, and in some cases the EHRs couldn't do that. So what can we find? They discovered it. Mass Health was smart enough to say, go figure it out. Or, they, or the organization said, we need to figure it out differently than what you're telling us, and they gave them the room to be able to do that. And that's really, I think, where a lot of this starts. Well, I think I interpreted your question a little bit differently in that what, if, what resources would I need? Right. And as a, you know, someone working within a large insurance company trying to I innovate and disseminate, um, the one resource that I think uh, is missing most frequently across organizations like ours, and I think we're trying to take action on this, is uh, the ability to gather qualitative information. We all, all of these ideas that we test are good ideas. They're all good ideas. And their, as I said before, their success or failure comes down to how, how they're implemented, how they're engaged, how they actually are applied, what's working and not working on the ground in the real world. And the claims data we look at, the sort of the, the more quality outcomes that we look at cannot capture the nuance of what's happening on the ground between a care manager and a patient, or a patient, a member, and an app or the, the person who's trying to set up an appointment or the, the transportation that gets that patient to the appointment. And in the absence of that nuance, the true day-to-day -day experiences that our members have, that our providers have, that our care managers have, about how the care is actually delivered and where the true barriers are and where we can actually intervene to make a difference, we are in the dark. Um, we end up figuring these things out. It takes, but it, but it takes time. And if we could, if we had more resources to be on the ground to observe and to learn and to interview and to get that sort of qualitative information, I think those cycles of, of improvement and innovation would be much more rapid. And I think we'd get to better answers faster. More anthropologists. <laughs> <laughs> A shout out to our <laughs> So I think we invest a lot of money in um, coming up with new innovations, but not very much or not as much in understanding how to diffuse. And so I think I'm, you know, I would put more money into understanding the how of the diffusion, not only individual um, interventions, but, but how do you create organizations that 
uh, look at their own data and identify uh, where they need to improve and, um, and experiment internally um, to um, take models externally and adapt them uh, for their own use. And so I think it's, um, you know, potentially um, using the uh, extension model or others trying to support the healthcare delivery system to adapt and innovate and use their own data and improve. That, that's where I would like to spend the money. That's great. Um, well, uh, as we uh, close out our day, I want to uh, remind you that this uh, issue and briefing were only possible because of the support of the Peterson Center on Healthcare, the Blue Shield of California Foundation, Leon M. and Harry B. Helmsley Charitable Trust and uh, ARC. Um, it's been a, a, a rich day. I hope you feel the same. Um, we have a lot to learn and a lot to learn about how we learn, uh, but we've also made uh, tremendous progress. So uh, thank you for joining us today, and please join me in thanking our final panel. And we are adjourned.